Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of the 2020 Bank on Washington Forum. First, I want to thank all of the people who made this event possible. It's my pleasure to introduce you to partners who generously gave in-kind and monetary support for this forum. You will see their names scroll across your monitor today. Next, I want to introduce myself and leave you with a thought before I introduce our presenter. My name is Linda Taylor, and I'm the Vice President of Housing and Financial Empowerment for the Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle. Like others you have heard yesterday, I wear multiple hats. One is the co-chair for the Financial Empowerment Network, Homeownership and Foreclosure Team. That's one of the ones I'm most proud of. As COVID-19 continues to impact the health and economic security of millions of Americans, it is important to evaluate ways to mitigate the risk of foreclosure. The team I lead are ramping up for foreclosures like what we saw in 2009. In the forum program, you will find a resource section that includes a link to the Washington Foreclosure Prevention Resource Guide, a tool to educate homeowners about the foreclosure process. If you have a friend, family member, or coworker having difficulty paying their mortgage, consider sharing the link. Early intervention to a HUD housing counseling agency is critical. You will find a link to HUD's website and a list of Washington Housing Counseling Agencies and the Washington Home Ownership Resource Center in the foreclosure guide. You will also find a link to our next presenter's paper, Pre-Existing Conditions, Accessing the Financial Services Response to Racism, Inequality, and COVID-19 in your form program. On page seven, they state nationally, April saw the largest one month increase in mortgage delinquencies ever recorded. As the number of borrowers who stopped paying their home loans spiked by 1.6 million. What is your happiest money memory? My happiest memory was becoming a homeowner. And I did it at an early age. It is my pleasure to introduce our next presenter, Jose Cisnerios, City and County of San Francisco, and Molly Cohen, City of San Francisco, Office of the Financial Empowerment, who will be discussing the August 2020 paper, Pre-Existing Conditions, Accessing the Financial Services Response to Racism, Inequality, and COVID-19. Jose Cisneros is the treasurer for the city and county of San Francisco, where he serves as the city's banker and chief investment officer, managing all tax and revenue collections for San Francisco. Appointed in 2004, and first elected in 2005, Cisneros has used his experience in the tech and banking industry to enhance and modernize taxpayer systems and successfully manage the city's portfolio through major recessions. Cisneros believes that his role of safeguarding the city's money extends to all San Francisco residents and continues to expand his role as financial educator, advocate for low-income San Franciscos through award-winning programs like Kindergarten to College, Bank on San Francisco, and the Financial Justice Project. Cisnerio serves on the State Bar of California Board of Trustees. He is co-chair of the Cities for Financial Empowerment Coalition, and in 2014 through 2015, 
He served as vice chair of the President's Advisory Council on Financial Capabilities for Young Americans. Molly Cohen serves as the interim director of the San Francisco Office of Financial Empowerment. After previous roles in the San Francisco Office of the Treasurer and Tax Collector, the New York City Mayor's Office, and the New York City Council, Molly May led San Francisco Municipal Bank Feasibility Task Force and the coordinated pre-trial and bail reform efforts for the New York City Mayor's Office. Molly received a law degree from Harvard Law School and a Bachelor's of Art from Brown University. She is passionate about financial empowerment, community development, education, books, and baked goods. Join me in welcoming Treasurer Jose Cisneros and Molly Cohen. Good morning. Hello, everyone. I'm Jose Cisneros, San Francisco Treasurer. It's great to be here, and I'm really excited to join you this morning. Molly and I have a lot of exciting things to talk to you about. I want to give you a little bit of background. Um, I've been treasurer for San Francisco for over 16 years. And during that time, we worked very hard to build a strong financial system for the city residents that is fair, inclusive, and allows equal opportunity for all. And I believe we do this by increasing financial security, by combating predatory financial forces in our community, and by empowering people to invest in themselves. And I've seen how local government can be a major driver of the change, uh, these kinds of changes that makes the need to happen. Now I'm sure uh, you join me in all knowing that we've seen two distinct financial systems in our communities. The first is the financial mainstream, where people enjoy access to financial products that are healthy, that help them manage their money, um, establish credit and build wealth. Um, really solid, positive things that they can that they can work on. It creates upward mobility and allows people to invest in themselves and their children, their homes, their education, even starting a business. But we also know there's another system, uh, the financial fringe that strips wealth from those who can least afford it. You know what I'm talking about, check cashers, payday lenders, rent to own stores, pawn brokers, auto title lenders. These are the types of financial services that many are forced to turn to when they become disconnected from the financial mainstream. We know that these, these businesses and these predatory forces cause a lot of, of damage, and yet we know that still close to one out of four people in the United States rely on these predatory financial products. And the number increases even higher with African American and Hispanic households. And even in our wealthy city of San Francisco, nearly one out of three children are born into families with no savings or assets of any kind. And 40% of our residents have a some subprime credit score. So I'm sure you could seen this. We know this is not a minor problem or something that's just limited to the very, very poor of, amongst us. This is a problem that's systemic and that we need to address. And we wanted to use our abilities in City Hall to help people, to, to find out how we could help people avoid taking out payday loans with 400% annual percentage rates of interest, um, or spending hundreds of hundreds of dollars a year in fees paid to a check casher. We launched the Office of Financial Empowerment 15 years ago, and we've launched a number of programs since that time. One of our first programs was designed to help people get access to the federal earned income tax credit. Um, we, we estimated that nearly $12 million of EITC money eligible to low-income families in San Francisco was being left unclaimed. So we provided an incentive, cash local match, and we got tens of thousands of folks each year to sign up for the EITC. But what we learned from that program was that 
there was oftentimes a very fundamental problem that people were facing, which is that they didn't even have a bank account. When we went to mail them, their cash local match reward incentive for getting the EITC uh, monies, we were sending them just one more check that they needed to take to a check casher. So we did research on how we could maybe help people go, move from being unbanked to banked. And we put together and launched the first of its kind program called Bank on San Francisco. Simply a program where we worked in partnership with financial institutions, banks and credit unions. We got these financial institutions to do everything they could to help the unbanked folks in our city. We got them to agree to take whatever form of identification was allowed, including uh, consulate cards, uh, whatever was allowed under, under federal law. We wanted to make sure they kept their fees low. And they even allowed folks who had had problems in the past to find a way to earn their way back into the banking system. When we launched our Bank on San Francisco program, we had 80% of all of our local bank and credit union locations involved in our program. And we were able to truly send out the message that said, if you don't have a bank account, consider going to get one because you're going to be far better off. Uh, we found that our, our message delivered by the city's voice uh, moved nearly 75,000 unbanked folks in San Francisco over the first few years to move from being unbanked to banked. Uh, which meant that they then could keep their money safe. Uh, they could avoid getting ripped off and spending excessive fees. And, and, and we wanted to really make sure that we were doing everything we could to help people be successful. And because of that, we've actually seen through the results of the FDIC National uh, Survey of banked and underbanked individuals, we've actually decreased the number of unbanked folks in our city by just under 5%. And I'm certain we've seen similar outcomes even up in Seattle where you are. But still, we know that too many people remain unbanked or underbanked. Underbanked are folks that have a bank account, but they still, for whatever reason, rely on check cashers and payday lenders occasionally and still end up being ripped off. Um, so we wanna do everything we can to, um, to make sure we're, we're making uh, the system safe and, and, and available to everybody. And it's that availability that turned out to be one of our biggest problems. One of the things we learned very clearly is that people who had a problem with their banking account in the past have, have ended up being blocked from getting a banking account in the future. And it's all due to these uh, consumer checking account screening agencies like check systems and one called early warning systems. They will put people on a list just the same way a credit bureau does for credit, credit card histories. And anyone with a trouble in their past, particularly someone with who's been labeled as, as committing fraud or some other form of abuse, they can oftentimes be blocked um, from ever getting another bank account from any bank. And what we're pro finding is that this system is very difficult to work with. It's full of confusion. Plenty of people have errors or other types of inaccuracies in their records, and they're unfairly being blocked from accessing the most fundamental tool we all need, uh, which is having a bank account to be successful. So we have had our smart money coaching program, which connects folks with one-on-one -on -one with individual coaches We've been having our coaches help people find out and review their own check systems report, the same way someone might review their credit, their credit report. We've partnered with a great group called the Credit Builders Alliance, and they work in collaboration with check systems to help people navigate this process, even give them a way to dispute errors that might have occurred in their reports and be able to fix them and resolve them. We'll soon be coming out with a report on check systems and our experience with getting people to be able to be able to clean up their histories and move ahead and make progress uh, without being unfairly encumbered or limited. We've also identified asset limits in public benefit programs that many of our governments manage and the consumer debt that may be levied from bank accounts 
as key barriers that erode trust among consumers and oftentimes can keep them from opening bank accounts because of their concerns. California, our state of California, has taken some positive steps in recent years to raise or eliminate asset limits in public benefits programs like TANF, SNAP, and Medicaid. But certainly more work needs to be done. And similarly, protections against debt collectors have been strengthened in California as well. Though abusive debt collectors continue to harm consumers and our local economies. As of September, a little more than $1,700 in a consumer's bank account is protected against a bank levy. Uh, where, so debt collectors can't take that money that would bring the consumer's balance below that amount. It's not enough, certainly, but it's an important protection. And previously, bank levies could wipe out all the funds in a consumer accounts. I believe in the state of Washington, you guys have a $500 protection limit. Again, better than nothing, but we all need to see what we can do to improve this. All the work I'm referencing uh, comes from our pre-pandemic uh, work. And since the beginning of the pandemic, we've joined local governments, local governments and nonprofits across the country in pivoting a lot of our work to respond to the crisis. I myself have served as the chair of, of San Francisco's Economic Recovery Task Force, working with business leaders and community representatives in order to chart an equitable path for economic recovery in the city. But we know that the economy is likely to get worse before it gets better. And our task force outlined ways to support the city during this time. It's certainly a complex situation, but in early days of the crisis, the government response helped keep many people afloat, including the great um, funds that were able to be resourced from the federal government, as well as local and state forbearances on um, home loans and student loans and eviction uh, moratoriums. We've already expanded our unemployment benefits, at least for now, and other protections, but they're likely to be ending in the next three to six months, so we need to stay vigilant. This is why we're gonna do everything we can to preserve financial stability and uh, press for sustained relief from the private sector as well as the public sector to help keep people afloat. Thanks for spending time with us. At this time, I'd like to pass it off to my colleague, Molly Cohen, to talk about our recent report on pre-existing uh, conditions and how banks and, and financial services institutions have responded during the COVID-19 crisis. Molly? Thank you so much for that, uh, Treasurer Cisneros. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you to Alice um, and the whole team, um, particularly Spondulix, for uh, putting to, helping to put together this event. Um, we are so excited to be here at the 2020 Bank on Washington Forum um, and to talk about our report called Pre-Existing Conditions, um, Assessing the Financial Services Response to Racism, Inequality, and COVID-19. Um, so, you know, the Treasurer spoke about this briefly, um, but we're the San Francisco Cisco Office of Financial Empowerment. Um, our, our main goal is really to leverage the power of City Hall to strengthen economic security and mobility for low-income families. Um, and as the treasurer mentioned, you know, we do that through financial coaching, through bank on, um, and as it turns out, through crisis response, which we'll talk a little bit about um, today. So a brief agenda of, you know, sort of what I want to cover and where I want to go. Um, just I'll provide a little bit of background on, um, you know, sort of where we are as a country and how this report came to be. Um, talk a little bit about the surveys that we put out and what we found, uh, what banks were telling us in terms of their crisis response. Talk about what our recommendations are and next steps. Um, but then really would love to have the opportunity to hear from you guys um, questions and comments um, around what you're seeing in the state of Washington. Um, you know, I think each state is sort of handling the crisis a little bit different um, and each sort of financial institution is handling the crisis a little bit differently, but um, there's so much that we can learn from one another um, and from our financial institutions and families um, around really what does an effective crisis response look like. So with that, we'll move into sort of some background information. Um, you know, I'm sh I, I'm sure you sort of you guys all know this, but I think it's really helpful just to talk a little bit before getting into COVID nineteen and the crisis, just to talk a little bit about where the trends were headed even before the crisis. Um, you know, I think we were seeing a lot of sort of troubling and interconnected issues. Um, 
We're seeing increases in the racial wealth gap. Um, you know, we know it still exists. It's actually not improving. It's in fact getting worse. Um, we're seeing household debt increase, an affordable housing crisis. Um, we're seeing lack of access to the financial mainstream. Um, and so just to dive a bit more on each of those topics to sort of, you know, set what is somewhat of a depressing table. Um, I'm sure, you know, you heard from Ann Price yesterday about the racial wealth gap. Um, she is really one of the experts in thinking about the racial wealth gap and how to address it. Um, you know, centuries of discrimination um, and sort of lack of access have led to significant and growing racial wealth gap. Um, you know, some of the analysis you'll see find that white families have 41 times the wealth of a black family. Um, I'm originally from the Boston area and the Boston Globe did an analysis um, and found that non-immigrant black families in the Boston area had a median net worth of $8 compared to um, over 200,000 for white families. Um, and when this came out, it, like people assumed it was a typo, it was a huge scandal. How is it possible that, you know, black families only had $8 um, in wealth. And part of it is because of the growth um, in household debt, um, which we'll get into in just a second. This graph um, in the PowerPoint that you'll see, I really like it. It's done by the Washington Post using Federal Reserve data. But one of the things that it shows is that really at every level of education, um, black wealth lags behind white wealth. Um, and in fact, the disparity only increases as education goes up. Um, and partially this is because of sort of like you know, familial wealth and inheritance. And partially this is again, because of student debt. Um, so one of the other trends that we're seeing is the, you know, the growth in household debt. When we think about the 2008, 2009 crisis, you know, we all think about sort of debt and, you know, mortgage foreclosures. And again, well, that's another trend we're gonna get to in a second. Um, but what we're seeing is actually even pre COVID the amount of debt that families had was actually inching higher than it was in 2008. Um, it's something we, our office works on a fair amount, but we're seeing student debt has actually more than doubled from where it was in 2008. Um, it used to be 600 million, you know, now it's 1.4 trillion. Um, we believe that every student should, you know, go to college and have access to post-secondary education, but it's also really important, particularly during a crisis moment to think about, you know, what are the implications of that debt? Um, Consumer debt default rates were actually growing pre-pandemic, um, and you know, post-pandemic, obviously, we're seeing um, increases. And you know, as forbearance ends, we'll see more and more um, defaults. So, next up, affordable housing crisis. Um, there are so many ways to envision and talk about the affordable housing crisis. Um, I really like this. Um, figure that was put together by the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Um, what it what this figure shows is it explains the uh, wage per per state that you need to work, or sorry, that you need to make uh, to rent a two bedroom apartment working one job 40 hours a week. Um, in California, it's over $30. In Washington, it's 24. Um, and both of that, it, those are compared to the, you know, statewide minimum wages of $12. So, um, this is true in San Francisco. I mean, San Francisco is the poster child for this, but also true in Seattle, New York City, Washington, DC. Um, we're seeing this acute affordability crisis and a homelessness epidemic. Um, again, this is contributing to the racial wealth gap. We know that black homeowners are more than three times as likely to be behind on mortgage payments than white homeowners. Um, you know, we heard from Linda Taylor about all the work that's going on in um, Washington state. And I just wanna take a second to call that out um, and the, to sort of really take a moment to highlight the fabulous work going on by the Financial Empowerment Network Homeownership and Foreclosure Prevention Team. Um, the work that was done in 2008, 2009 was so crucial um, and all the counseling that's happened in the meantime. And sadly, um, I know that this work will be very necessary again, um, given COVID-19. So um, just, to mention a couple people by name that have been instrumental. We have Tom McKay from the Northwest Justice Project, Linda Taylor, obviously, who was kind enough to introduce us, um, Denise Rodriguez from the Washington Home Ownership Center, Nathan Pepin from the Washington State Department of Commerce, um, Erica Malone from the City of Seattle, and Lynn Peters from the Washington Department of Financial Institutions. Um, keep up the good work, guys. Um, I know, um, unfortunately, that this work will be more important than ever given uh, COVID-19. And then the last trend, just to sort of bring up, and again, this is your bread and butter. I won't bore you with this, but uh, it wouldn't be a bank on conference if we didn't uh, mention a couple times 
uh, access to the financial mainstream, um, and frankly, the racial disparities that we see there. Um, we know that Black and Latino households are more likely to be on or underbanked, um, about 20% for Black families, um, compared to only 2% for white families. Um, and another thing that we've sort of seen research about, which um, is just surprising and something important for us to wrestle with um, is that when Black and Latino consumers do use banks, they tend to pay more fees um, and they're more likely to sort of like rely on fringe financial products um, and they're less likely to get sort of access to favorable products like small business loans and refinancing, um, which is just to say that sort of getting people in the door of a bank um, is certainly the first step. Um, you know, but the next step is making sure that we're setting them up for success, you know, making sure that they're getting access to the products and services um, that, you know, someone of a, in a higher socioeconomic bracket would, would access. Um, and that will come, uh, that will come, we'll come back to that um, when we talk about sort of COVID-19 response, um, because there's a lot of ways in which um, relief may be available, but only if you know how to ask for it and what words to use, um, which is just sort of a really troubling um, scenario and a scenario that is just gonna exacerbate inequality. So um, speaking of exacerbating inequalities, um, one of the things that we know, and you know, we said this in the report and we've heard this in the news, but that the crises actually turns out are not great equalizers. Um, we know that COVID-19 is hitting Americans unequally. Uh, Black and Latino Americans are more likely to be impacted by the virus. You know, they're less likely to have strong health insurance. They're more likely to have pre-existing conditions. They're less likely to be able to work from home, less likely to have savings or family resources and wealth to fall back on. So what does that mean? That means they're more likely to be sick, more likely to be hospitalized, you know, more likely to pass away. Um, and so I think when we think about the relief that is being offered, um, we need to make sure that we're really focusing on, on the communities that are most vulnerable. Um, and I know that the treasurer and the economic recovery task force, that was a big focus on sort of vulnerable communities. Um, and just to sort of underscore this point a little bit, um, we took a, a couple maps. One is a map of our, you know, San Francisco redlining map, you know, around 1930s, 1940s. Um, you guys all know what redlining was. I won't sort of bore you with the details there. But if you look at areas that are redlined, um, you know, where where banks and the government refuse to issue mortgages, um, and then you compare it to the maps where um, we're seeing the highest COVID, you know, highest prevalence of COVID-19 cases, um, you'll see that the legacy of redlining is still with us. Like areas that were redlined now are, you know, tend to be poor, there tend to be um, areas where people are more likely to get sick. Um, and so just, that is just to say that like these sort of historical trends and historical trends in banking and finance um, are still sort of shaping the world that, that we see and that we live in today. So a bit about uh, the genesis of this report. So this report um, came about because we were um, wanting to understand the landscape of COVID-19 banking relief. We, we wanted to understand that for ourselves as an office. Um, we wanted to understand that for the people who were calling us and asking what they could do. Um, we wanted to understand because we wanted to sort of push um, other financial institutions to do more. Um, and so we sent out a survey to 29 banks um, and received eight responses. Um, we also have a co-author of the California Reinvestment Coalition, who is fabulous. They do a lot of work around sort of reinvestment um, and access to financial institutions. Um, they also sent out a similar survey to uh, 41 banks and they received 17 responses. Um, and while we were working on this report, um, we learned about the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor at the hands of police. Um, we really were seeing the visceral response um, of so many Americans to violence and injustice um, and the sort of continued emergence and power of the Black Lives Movement, Black, excuse me, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and as we were sort of wrestling with that, we were sort of seeing, you know, all the slides before, which is showing, you know, the sort of systemic and historic racism in our banking system and the ways that people have really been marginalized and kept out of the mainstream system. Um, and so it felt really important that we needed to sort of recognize the crisis within the crisis um, and to, you know, not just address sort of the immediate crisis today of COVID-19, but also to address all the historical sort of, um, all the historical acts that had led to, um, you know, people of color being less likely to have access to a bank account, less likely to have, you know, familial wealth. Um, and so it became important to us to sort of address both those things um, in conjunction, which you'll see as we, as we get into sort of 
what questions we asked and what we found. So the survey that we sent out was um, relatively general. We wanted really to give people an opportunity um, and banks an opportunity to tell us what they were doing. So we asked about what support they were providing to consumer clients, um, you know, in particular people who had checkings accounts. Um, what support were they providing to struggling borrowers, you know, people with auto, home, you know, credit card, loan, credit card debt, et cetera. Um, how were they treating CARES Act payments? Um, a big thing was whether they would uh, cash checks for non-customers. You know, we have a lot of people in San Francisco who still may not have access to um, safe and affordable bank accounts, despite all the work that we've done. And, and the treasurer explained why some of those reasons are. Um, and another big issue was wanting to make sure that CARES Act payments weren't being garnished um, because people have debt in collections, you know, another big issue. Um, and lastly, um, did people have access to safe and affordable, ideally bank on certified accounts? Um, similarly, CRC put together their survey questions. Um, they, again, work a little bit more on housing and um, reinvestment, which is a little bit, we're more focused on um, consumer uh, issues, but actually it was a nice combination between the two of us um, for this report. But so their questions were asking about um, our banks and financial institutions offering six month mortgage forbearance. Um, if so, what percent of clients had requested it? Um, were they tracking who's requesting it by race, ethnicity, and gender? Um, this is a huge issue when we think about sort of how do we address systemic racism? The first thing is, can we even track it? Do we even know? Um, protections for tenants. So one of the things, if a multifamily lender gets mortgage forbearance, are those tenants protected from, you know, being evicted? Um, you know, did the banks originate PPP loans? Did they do it only to customers? What sort of outreach to businesses did they do? Again, are they tracking it by race, gender, and ethnicity? Um, are they offering forbearance for small business credit card consumer auto loans? Are they offering grants to small businesses? Would they support a grant fund? Are they waiving fees like late fees, minimum account balance fees, seizing negative reporting, refraining from sending accounts to collections? Um, are they how are they communicating with borrowers and what languages? What's the average wait times? Um, and then sort of a catch all. Are there sort of any additional efforts that they want to um, talk about? So um, it was definitely a pretty ambitious survey. Um, and you'll see that's why maybe uh, response rates were, um, you know, they were certainly decent, but, you know, not 100 percent. Um, but it was really valuable to get the responses that we did, um, in part because it allowed us to sort of get a little bit of a landscape of what banks were doing. I mean, in part because it also allowed us to get that information out to consumers. So what did we learn um, from financial institutions? What did we hear? So importantly and very near and dear to our heart, um, we learned about sort of checkings and savings accounts and sort of consumer fees. Um, what we have found is that um, checking and saving clients can request fee waivers and refunds for overdraft fees, non-sufficient funds fees, monthly maintenance fees, ATM fees. But um, the burden is for sure on the consumer to make to ask. Um, and what we found is a, the bank may only waive one fee or one month's fee. Um, for example, we had a client reach out to us who was charged fee after fee after fee um, every month because he wasn't able to have the minimum balance required by his account because he had lost his job and was struggling financially. Um, when he reached out to the bank, they said, oh yeah, sure, yeah, we'll waive a, a monthly maintenance fee, but they waived it for one month versus the seven months of the pandemic. Um, so we worked with him. We got him connected to a financial coach. We, we changed his account. We got the bank to remove the additional fees. Um, but, you know, that client was incredibly proactive to reach out to us. Then he was proactive to work with the financial coach. Um, you know, not everybody is going to have the time, capacity, et cetera, um, to proactively, you know, get the relief that they deserve. Um, so, you know, just something to We'll talk more about sort of what are the pitfalls of the relief, but just give you a little teaser there. Um, you're probably not shocked. Um, next, lending products and forbearance. Um, payment deferrals are, are really common, which is so important um, and wonderful. Um, but, you know, the terms are going to vary based on the institution, the product line, the type of loan, um, mortgages. Banks typically were starting with up to 90 days forbearance, um, but up to six months were being offered. Um, we've even heard one or two banks that are offering up to a year. There's some inconsistencies on whether interest and fees are being charged, whether there's sort of a lump sum balloon payment required at the end. That's really troubling to sort of uh, housing and sort of 
mortgage counselors, this idea that somehow at the end of this forbearance period, you're supposed to have accumulated enough cash to pay it all off. Um, and um, there's also some, um, some concerns about whether multifamily uh, housing uh, borrowers who uh, are receiving forbearance, whether their tenants are being protected. Um, for example, there's a couple banks, Capital One and First Republic, require people to certify um, that if they're receiving, if a multifamily borrower is receiving a forbearance, that they are in compliance with state and local laws around eviction protection. Um, interestingly, um, we saw, and again, this, this survey was done in July, so things might look a lot differently now, but we saw about three to four, three to 14% um, of mortgage borrowers were requesting forbearance. Um, you know, we had a conversation with a major financial institution and what they had said was actually that they're seeing a lot of people request forbearance, but then when the time comes, they're actually able to make the payment, but people just want to have this in their back pocket. Um, I certainly hope that that trend continues, though I suspect that, you know, we'll see more and more people needing to, um, you know, needing to, to, to go into forbearance. Um, for small business loans, forbearance was typically around 90 days, um, though it varied more bank to bank. Um, and for consumer, right, our credit card, our auto, et cetera, um, typically only 30 days to a couple months, definitely less relief than we're seeing for mortgage shows and small businesses, small business loans. Um, again, I think sort of mortgage is probably the highest priority, but um, it's also really important these consumer loans, right? One good thing that we're seeing is that banks have said that they wouldn't foreclose or repossess based on default. Um, so people at least will be able to keep their, their cars um, and that they wouldn't report at least initially um, defaults to credit bureaus. So there is some sort of, um, at least a little bit of bright spots in the consumer debt um, sort of arena. What else? What about the Paycheck Protection Program? Um, this was a great opportunity for banks to tell us about all the good stuff that they were doing. Um, all the banks participated um, that we uh, surveyed. Um, they were all very proud of their participation. Um, though, you know, and this is something that we've seen, um, all the banks tended to prioritize existing clients and clients that they had um, an existing relationship with. Oh, and I'm sorry, I, I like jumped right in without saying um, Paycheck Protection Program, PPP. It was designed by Congress to distribute um, much needed no interest forgivable loans through banks um, to allow people to keep small businesses and businesses to keep people on payroll for eight weeks. Um, so with some things that we learned that were just sort of exciting and we want to highlight, um, J.P. Morgan Chase partnered with the U.S. Black Chamber of Commerce and the National Urban League to really try to target um, PPP loans to clients who wouldn't otherwise get them and that they may not have done outreach to um, otherwise. Um, community Bank of the Bay, which is sort of a small community bank, um, in, uh, in sort of the Silicon Valley area. They actually said that they originated, um, of the loans that they had done in the past 10 years, they actually originated 50% uh, of them during, you know, for the PPP program, which is just an incredible sort of statistic and shows how much they really, you know, got their program up and running. Um, and lastly, Lending Club, which isn't a bank, but is sort of a, um, you know, financial services provider, they offered loans to new and existing clients. So it's definitely different to offer loans to new clients. Um, and they included self-employed individuals, which again, was um, not as common for uh, typical sort of multinational banks. But as with so many things, um, you know, the PPP loan was in lending was an incredibly successful program on the one hand, um, but also it, you know, reinforced existing disparities. Um, the Small Business Administration put out data on um, sort of racial demographics of who received PPP loans. Um, you know, I think only about 15% of businesses identified their race um, in their applications, but um, of those who did choose to identify, uh, Black-owned businesses received only 2% of loans um, compared to white-owned businesses, which received 83%. Um, and again, uh, some other sort of data that's been collected showed that only 12% of Black and Latinx business owners who applied for a PPP loan received what they requested, um, the full amount that they requested. So again, we're seeing um, how these sort of programs are just exacerbating disparities. Um, what else are banks doing? Um, one of the things that CRC was really interested in um, and is, uh, you know, 
looking into going forward is, is anybody just providing grants to small business owners? Not, not alone, but just saying like, you know what, this is a tough time here. You just need some, here's some funding. Um, none of the banks were providing grants, um, but a lot of them were supporting CDFIs and some of the CDFIs um, were themselves doing grants instead of loans. Um, U.S. Bank, Citibank, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, they all reported significant um, support to CDFIs. Um, interestingly, Silicon Valley Bank, which is, um, again, another community bank in Silicon Valley, they actually did something pretty neat. They uh, do affordable housing lending, and they supported the tenants who live in these affordable housing developments directly through micro grants. Um, so they provided, I think, like five thousand dollar grants to a number of tenants um, living in 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 you know housing that that they're underwriting. Um, and they also plan to donate PPP fees. Um, I know that that's been sort of a bit of a conversation around some of the the larger banks. Um, one other thing, and again, this is very important to CRC, um, is whether or not when banks are underwriting multifamily loans, they're underwriting it based on existing rent, um, meaning what tenants are paying today, or whether they're underwriting it on, you know, sort of what what, what tenants could be paying in the future, um, sort of market rate rents, um, particularly in places with rent control. Um, most, if not all, banks were underwriting based on existing rent, um, which is just an important way to sort of try to prevent displacement. So um, the big thing, and I would say sort of our major takeaway from this report is um, how is this release accessible? Um, how do you get this relief? That mortgage forbearance is offered, it's great that they're waiving ATM fees and overdraft fees, but how? Um, and, and generally what we're seeing is that consumers need to go to the bank and request relief. So phone, online, in person. Um, we're also seeing that people may need to demonstrate harm, right? You might need to show, I mean, they're your bank, they have your bank statement, they should see that you have no money, um, but you may need to get a letter from your employer showing, oh yes, you know, this person has been furloughed, or oh yes, this person's hours have been reduced. Um, and that can be obviously just sort of, a that's a significant barrier. There are other barriers to accessing relief. Um, you need to know that the relief exists, right? Um, you need to know how to access it. You need to have, you may need to have technology, right? Do you need a fax machine or a scanner to get that letter from your employer to your bank? Um, what about clients with limited English proficiency? Um, in general, like all, everybody's bank says, sure, call us to talk to us about mortgage relief, but you might face long hold times. Okay, well, what happens if you're a central worker? What happens if you're working more than one job? Um, how is that really accessible to you? So um, I think, and we'll we'll get. We're, I'm going to move from this to sort of get into our recommendations. But if there's one thing I would like to like leave you with and have you take away, um, it is that accessibility of relief is so important. Relief that is offered but that is hard to access is frankly no better than no relief at all. Um, so. Our number one recommendation is make relief universal and automatic. Don't put the burden on consumers to come to you and request relief. Um, we And we know this is an issue also, be, this is an equity issue, right? Consumers have been systematically excluded, are more likely to hesitate before calling a bank. They may not know to call in the first place. They may have been mistreated um, by banks in the past. Um, we saw, you know, we, there's lessons from 2008, 2009, where we literally saw families, um, and again, I'm sure you know you guys in Washington State saw the same, but families lost their homes because of unnecessary paperwork burdens, because of documentation issues, because of language barriers, right? Like let's not make the same mistakes that we made last time, um, particularly while families are sort of dealing with this dual crisis of um, COVID-19, right? They might also be is dealing with health issues. Um, so that is, our, that is always our, our number one ask. Um, what else? Um, you know, for consumer banking, checking and savings accounts, I, we talked about this before. None of this will be surprising. I'll go through it relatively quickly. Um, but offer free check cashing for the economic impact payments and really any government issued or payroll check. Promote overdraft free bank on certified accounts. Um, I'm sure Alice will absolutely agree with that. Um, stop assessing overdraft or NSF fees for any transactions. Um, and this one, I just want to sort of take a second to talk a bit more about this. Um, part of what happens also with these overdrafts is if people get too many overdrafts, they're going to have their account closed for account abuse. It's going to then be reported to check systems, and then they're going to have difficulty accessing a bank account again for you know any number of years. Um, so it really becomes a cycle 
that will keep people out of the financial mainstream for years to come. Um, it's not just about sort of the fee and whether people can afford to pay the fee. Um, eliminate monthly maintenance fees, minimum balance requirements, ATM fees. Um, allow people to open accounts online um, and eliminate fees with online bill pay or other online services. Like right now, we should be trying to get people to 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 bank online as much as possible versus going into branches. But um, just one other thing to say is we know that, and we know this from our college savings program that Office of Financial Empowerment runs, low-income families um, and families of color are much more likely to want to go in person to a branch. Um, and so to the extent that branches are having their hours reduced or closed, like let's maintain the availability um, in low-income communities and communities of color. Next up, uh, borrow, borrow protections and lendings. Um, suspend and defer loan payments and stop assessing late fees or interest for, for borrowers. Um, you know, we had said, you know, do this all for, for one year or, you know, until this crisis is over, whichever is longer. Um, I don't think any of us really know um, how long it's going to be. Similar, stop all foreclosure pr proceedings, evictions, and repossessions. Um, provide mortgage forbearance for all single family homeowners and affordable housing developers and small landlords um, based solely on, um, you know, someone saying, I need this relief. Um, I think small landlords is a, a big issue. And, you know, in San Francisco, we talk a lot about um, single family homeowners. We talk a lot about um, tenants, but we do have a fair number of small landlords who might have one or two buildings, you know, they might be retired. Um, and that is how they, you know, they themselves pay their rent by, um, when their mortgage, you know, by the rent that they're collecting. Um, develop strong, uh, equitable real estate owned policies. Um, this is a big thing that CRC is focused on. And essentially the goal is to make sure that what happened in 2008 was we had a lot of single family homes that were foreclosed upon and bought up by large private equity firms like, you know, BlackRock. Um, and then they become landlords. And so the goal is, um, can we, you know, allow the community to purchase up properties, you know, that have been foreclosed upon. Um, you know, CRC has an anti-displacement code of conduct. Well, thanks, please um, endorse that and help small businesses by funding grants, making smaller loans, collecting neighborhood and race data, um, and obviously investing in CDFIs. Um, and sort of lastly, and again, this is a big one for CRC, but for us as well, just in terms of reinvestment in corporate citizenship. So a big one is tracking um, and reporting on lending and relief activity by race, ethnicity, gender, zip code, and census tract. Um, there's some federal, there's some like sort of Dodd-Frank issues around this. There's some legal ambiguity. They're hopefully working on rulemaking to make it clear that um, banks should and can uh, track activity by um, race, ethnicity, and gender. Um, because if we don't track it, then we won't know, right, what disparities are looking look like. Um, strengthen corporate social responsibility, increase philanthropic and other support. Um, you know, again, going back to this issue of systemic racism, um, embrace reparations by making specific and significant dollar commitments to initiatives with the Black community designed to address systemic racism and banking and restricted access to credit, um, among other measures. Um, there was a wonderful New York Times op-ed by Angela Blackwell Glover on this issue. Um, I will put it in the chat in case people are interested in reading more. Um, she said it far better than, you know, I could ever say it, we could ever say it. So we'll we'll let her um, and her thoughts speak for themselves. Um, and lastly, engage with um, nonprofits, CRC, uh, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color communities, um, local agencies, consumer advocates, and community stakeholders. Um, as this crisis is going on, I mean, I think we all sort of initially thought this was a three month crisis and then we'll get through this. Um, and that is, you know, just honestly not where we're at. Um, Recommendations for policymakers. It wouldn't be a report if we didn't at least nudge our friends in the state and federal government um, to do a bit more for consumers. Um, nothing uh, that surprising, I'm sure, uh, as I'm sure you guys can imagine. Um, one of the big things is, um, in general, voluntary commitments from banks will not be enough. We know this. Um, so we need to strengthen consumer protections, right? We need state and, and federal government to pause payments, late fees, prohibit debt collection, prohibit, prohibit garnishments, evictions. Um, you know, we were happy to see, I know in Washington state, the governor extended your eviction moratorium through December 31st. That's fabulous. Um, that's a great start. We're almost in November, right? January 1 is actually right around the corner. What happens then? 
um, you know, halt the implementation of the OCC's rule that would weaken that would weaken CRA. That's an issue that is near and dear to, I'm sure, all of our hearts. So much of the work that we do with Bank On and and all of our reinvestment work is really predicated on the CRA and CRA being um, a real tool to get banks to sit down at the table and to work with us. Um, and again, just take the steps that are necessary to address this crisis, whether that's you know keeping people in their homes, stabilizing small businesses, more you know stimulus money. Um, you know, I think we're all um, we're all sort of seeing the distress in our communities and really wondering and 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 knowing that you know local governments can't do it all. So, what are sort of our next steps here? Um, we hosted a convening with um, OFE and CRC, community leaders and financial institutions to discuss the report. Um, we wanna have sort of additional convenings around specific issues, um, including potentially with uh, groups from um, outside California. You know, we know groups in New York are working on this issue. We're, I'm sure groups in Washington are working on this issue. Um, I think particularly when we're thinking about multinational banks, we will only be um, stronger if we come at it together. Um, we were requesting additional data and ongoing data about crisis relief um, and outcomes. And, you know, I think we just need to think about having more conversations and pushing more around issues in the racial wealth gap and reparation issues. Um, and specifically sort of like that doesn't have to be a super, um, it doesn't have to be a, a super hypothetical conversation, right? Like there are things banks can do today that will help, you know, make sure that the racial wealth gap doesn't get worse. Um, and so my question to you all is, you know, what else should we be doing? What else are you seeing happening um, in your communities? What are banks doing that is working? What are banks doing that is not working? What sort of relief have you guys been requesting? Um, and sort of what questions do you have? Um, and with that, I will thank you for your time. Um, and uh, if people have any questions or comments, would, would love to, to talk about them. And when I showed Alice this picture, she said, this makes me want to go to San Francisco. And I hope for all of our sakes that we're able to travel again very soon. So with that, um, I will end my slideshow. Sharing your insightful research and findings into the financial services response to racism, inequality, and COVID-19. Also, thank you to all of the people who made this event possible. And it's my pleasure to recognize the partners who generously gave in-kind and monetary support for the forum. You'll, continu you'll continue to see their names scroll across your monitor today. And it's time now for a short break to stretch and refresh, but first, I wanna introduce myself and leave you with a few thoughts before you go. My name is Tracy Goda. I am the Executive Director of the Financial Education Public-Private Partnership. The Financial Education Public-Private Partnership, or FEP, was created by the legislature to bring public and private stakeholders together to improve and advocate for financial education in Washington schools and communities by providing teacher trainings and quality resources. So now would you join me during the break to view a short film produced by student filmmakers at Spokane East Valley High School on financial inclusion that focuses on the barriers and solutions to being unbanked in Washington State. Lisa Wilkinson, who's one of my favorite teachers, the supervising teacher of the filmmakers is a FEP fellow. Now, as you grab your cup of coffee, consider what is the most important thing that a high school student should know about money before graduating. Now let's enjoy the film together. Hi there, I'm George. And I'm Alex. We'd like to talk to you on behalf of Bank on Washington. That's right, George, because you know what they say about money. What's that, Alex? Money talks. Are you finding yourself in bank struggling to find a financial institute that fits your needs and is willing to work with you? Don't worry. Being unbanked is a problem for many people for one reason or another. Whether it's past financial issues such as having no credit, not being able to afford a college education, saving up for a house, or buying that dream boat you've always wanted. This can make people feel judged, marginalized, and left struggling to take the next step they need for financial security. Helping the unbanked finance institution is where Bank on Washington swoops in to save the day. Bank on Washington is an organization that helps people that are unbanked, whether it's getting a college education, buying your first house, or finally getting that dream boat of yours. 
So in other words, Bank on Washington is the solution to your unbanked problems. For more information, make sure to visit Bank on Washington's website at bankonwashington.org. Bank, Bank on, on Washington, Washington, your financial solution.
Welcome back, and it's my pleasure to introduce our next presenter, Sylvia Raskin, who will be demonstrating the Money Mindset Cards, which is a set of 30 dialogue-based activity cards that help people develop their own path to financial well-being. Sylvia Raskin is a Senior Innovation Manager at the Prosperity Agenda, and a nonprofit, or, which is a nonprofit organization that designs pathways to economic and racial justice rooted in the wisdom, experience, and expertise of families enduring economic inequality. Sylvia works with families and staff to imagine, test, and realize programs where people thrive. Sylvia combines over 10 years of experience in large and small nonprofits with an MBA in sustainable systems to implement solutions across multiple social and economic issues, including workforce development, housing, and in financial access. Won't you enjoy me? join me in welcoming Sylvia? Okay, good morning. Hello, everyone. Um, I think I'm live. <laughs> My name is Sylvia Raskin um, with the Prosperity Agenda. I'll tell you more about our organization in a moment. Um, the uh, presentation that we'll be delivering today is around money mindset cards um, and more generally around our money mindset. What does that mean? What are our beliefs and values about money? Um, and a, uh, a product that we have that uh, inspires, that are conversations that inspire actions, easy ways that we can um, help people talk about money and um, deal with a lot of the financial stress that people are experiencing right now. So today we'll explore our money beliefs and we'll recognize how money creates power uh, and envision a world where everyone is safe and cared for. Um, I almost put, you know, envision a world of financial wellness. And to me, financial wellness, if we kind of break down some of that jargon, what it means to me is that everyone is safe and cared for, that people in our current world have enough money um, to be safe and cared for. So I'll tell you a little bit about the prosperity agenda. Uh, we design pathways to economic and racial justice rooted in the wisdom, experience, and expertise of families enduring economic inequality. So what that means is that we work with families and staff to imagine and test and realize programs where all people can thrive. And we really, when we think about uh, systems change, we work, on the, we work on interpersonal relationships, we work on the level of mindsets and narratives, and the, uh, the level of practices, what we actually do in our day-to-day -day work um, so we can shift those whole systems. And the, the fields that we tend to work in are financial education, quality jobs, uh, whole family approaches, and we offer our design and evaluation consulting uh, to nonprofits and government agencies. So I kind of want to start here that, um, you know, this is something that a lot of the speakers have already talked about, but millions of Americans are in financial crisis. Um, about half of the adults who were, uh, about 40 million um, Americans have lost their jobs uh, due to the coronavirus pandemic, and about half of those adults who were laid off uh, remain unemployed. Uh, Pew Research uh, says that about 32% of people um, have themselves or someone in their household has taken a pay cut or lost a job and oh, oh sorry 32 percent of people have uh, taken a pay cut and 42 percent of people have either lost a job or someone in their household has lost a job uh this you know of course the coronavirus uh, pandemic has exacerbated our racial uh, and income and gender inequalities that were already present in our country um with lower income adults um continuing to be most affected by the coronavirus uh, job-related pay cuts. So the percentage, 47% uh, of lower income adults say someone in their household has lost uh, a job um, or experienced a pay cut. This, um, you know, these issues are compounding on each other. Uh, the Commonwealth Fund says that 7.7 .7 million workers um, have lost jobs that were tied to their health insurance. Um, 
And this is obviously the worst time possible to lose your health insurance during a global pandemic that is tied to your job. Um, in, in terms of, you know, this is unfortunately only the beginning of a financial crisis that, you know, associated with coronavirus and the economic downturn. Um, and I think, you know, for folks on this call, the idea here is not to overwhelm uh, overwhelm you or anyone else kind of with this, but to be prepared that this isn't something that's going to go away once we're done with the coronavirus pandemic. This is uh, the economic fallout is going to last much longer and we can take steps now to uh, be able to ease that pain um, for, for people in our communities. Um, so one thing I wanted to mention about the uh, mortgage foreclosures is that um, there uh, for federally funded um, mortgages, uh, people were able to give a, a six month forbearance. But um, a study found that, uh, you know, people could skip uh, their payments and make up, make them up later, um, if they could, if they would ask their their mortgage lender for that. But out of the people who were eligible, um, about 680,000 people about the, uh, the 1 million people who were eligible about 680,000 people have not done that, and they are falling behind on their mortgage payments. So to me, that kind of underscores the necessity of connecting with your um, with your financial provider, with financial institutions, and for nonprofits to be connecting with connecting with our community members and and bridging that divide. Because there are programs like Bank On, there are programs like this uh, mortgage foreclosure. But if people don't know about it and don't know um, or have a hard time talking about it or asking for help, um, people can be falling through these safety, uh, the safety nets that were created. Um, looking a little bit deeper to people's experience of financial stress, about seven out of 10 people are concerned about their finance, finances during COVID. Um, you know, extremely concerned, very concerned, somewhat concerned, making up um, the greatest percentage. And what people are concerned about are having enough uh, savings, job security, income fluctuations, paying utility bills, um, and down the list. So major uh, financial issues kind of hitting everybody during this time. And you know we don't wanna underestimate the effect of that psychological and emotional stress on people's lives. You know, the number one reason that, um, you know, people in relationships fight or people fight with their kids, you know, is around money related stress. I kind of want to zoom out a little bit to, let's see, I want to make sure that, okay, great. Um, where the slides got a little bit of a delay. Um, zoom out to a larger instance, because this is what we're going to talk about, the dominant beliefs about money. Um, I want to underscore that this is happening at a societal level that workers, at an institutional level, that workers are paid dangerously low wages. Um, the Prosperity Agenda just came out with a strategy brief around essential workers um, and what essential workers, what frontline workers want employers to know um, about their work. And one of them is that the wages are dangerously low. We think about, oh, okay. <laughs> we think about, uh, you know, when we talk about minimum wage, uh, $7.25 an hour, that hasn't been raised in 11 years. And we think about 725 and we really calculate that out to an annual basis. Folks are making $15,000 a year. So, you know, yes, people are having trouble paying their bills on an annual salary of $15,000 a year. Um, I'm sure you've maybe, you know, heard these statistics around that someone making a minimum, working a minimum wage job uh, in no state in the United States can they afford a uh, one bedroom uh, apartment. And then we look at uh, median wage um, about, this is the median wage of everyone in the United States is 10.25 an hour, um, which calculates out to $21,000 a year. Um, and when we compare that with the top 1% of earners in the United States who are making $355 an hour, we really have to ask ourselves why um, we are, we are allowing our society to be in a place where most of most of our folks are making about twenty one thousand uh, dollars a year. Um, and this is a little, uh, you know, 
what we work on at the Prosperity Agenda is, you know, narrative change. And um, one of the dominant narratives is that society doesn't value people who are paid low wages, unfortunately, um, because our society values people primarily by the amount of income they make. Um, and if someone doesn't make a lot of income, then they are assumed that they haven't worked very hard um, and therefore shouldn't be paid more. And so it's this self-fulfilling prophecy. If people don't make a lot of money, they assume that their job is easy and therefore assume that that shouldn't be a high wage job. So that's one thing we really want to kind of look out for is to one, not be evaluating people on the income they make and not assuming that uh, frontline work is easy. You know, in the age of coronavirus, um, workers are risking their lives on a daily basis uh, and frontline and essential workers are providing valuable uh, skills and efforts to their jobs. You know, there's communication skills, interpersonal, teamwork, quality control, safety, all of these things um, are very important to our society um, and are only getting some of the uh, only getting some of the attention they deserve now. Unfortunately, a lot of the attention that they're getting now are a bit of a hollow, you know, folks are heroes, folks are essential workers, but we need to make sure we kind of back that up with the action of actually paying people for the value that they're delivering to society and the value that they're delivering to the businesses. Um, and so we want to kind of look at wage growth as well, um, you know, from a societal lens and see that wages have grown uh, for the rich, but not the bottom uh, 90 percent. Uh, wages uh, for, you know, the bottom 90 percent of our economy, almost everybody have only grown by about 24 uh, percent. When we compare that to the top one percent of the population, uh, their wages have grown by 158 percent. And the top 0.1 percent, their wages have grown 340 percent. So what we see is, um, you know, the wage gap continue, continuing to increase and at this point continuing to increase exponentially. So that's kind of the primer, um, and let's kind of dig into what we can do about this, um, our agenda today. So our uh, dominant beliefs about money, um, let's take a look at some of those. So I hope you're seeing this personal responsibility slide. I hope maybe I'm on a little bit of a delay. Um, so Anne Price talked about this uh, yesterday as well. Um, and I, I really loved her kind of exploration of it. So dominant belief in the United States is that uh, people have personal responsibility. So people choose, instigate, or otherwise cause their own circumstances, um, which in our society means if they are in distress, well, they only have themselves to blame or if they're successful, wow, they must be very smart and um, have, have worked hard for that. Um, and this, this mindset can, you know, if you follow along the train of this mindset, it says, because we cause our actions, then we can also be more held morally accountable for our actions. Uh, therefore, um, you know, what someone's life looks like is of their own choosing, right? This very individualistic, uh, perspective and and what Anne Price yesterday called toxic individualism. And then combining that with the dominant belief in the United States of meritocracy, um, uh, some research has found that the United States is more likely to believe, uh, more likely than other countries to believe that we have a meritocracy, meaning that everyone has the same opportunities to succeed and make money. Basically to say, that um, our society our society doesn't play a factor, right? There are not societal forces that are uh, changing the playing field for anybody um, and that everyone kind of has a fair shot at this, right? That it goes, that pairs very, very nicely with this idea or this belief in personal responsibility. It's all up to the individual. How hard they work is gonna determine their outcomes. It's gonna determine their success and determine their wealth. So these create this really toxic scenario 
where we believe or we might be led to believe that someone's net worth is their self-worth. So if they're successful, it is a direct result of their efforts. Um, and if they're in distress, they only have themselves to blame. Okay, I'm gonna pause for a moment to answer some technical difficulties. <laughs> Okay, the phone call wasn't Alice. <laughs> Hopefully things are still going well. Um, all right, so personal responsibility and meritocracy uh, connect um, in this very toxic situation where people assume that their net worth is their self-worth. Um, if they're successful, it's a direct result of their efforts. If people are in distress, they only have themselves to blame. Um, and this corrodes um, so much of our, our society, um, this on an individual level, people feel like um, they're worthless. They feel like, you know, their circumstances, they, they can beat themselves up um, while being in this very difficult scenario um, that we talked about earlier, feeling like they can't pay their bills and therefore they are personally responsible for that. Um, at the same time, you know, some of our uh, providers, you know, I used to work uh, in, in direct health services. Um, and it was very difficult, you know, I would come and see people in for the same issues over and over. And it was very um, easy, you know, to get into this place of like, well, you know, what are you doing here again? Um, and it was only when I kind of looked at things from this more global perspective to say, um, you know, we'll, we'll see this in a moment that the results of, of society, you know, trickle down to the individual. But we can't say that the individual can necessarily affect um, all the way up to society. So we need to take this, this more global view. Okay. <laughs> um, this worldview kind of comes together and, you know, the result of it, uh, and this, this comes from some work by a movement generation who I'm very inspired by. Um, basically it excuses extreme wealth extraction and hoarding, right? The, the, um, image we looked at earlier uh, that the 1% is earning $700,000 a year while most of Americans are earning $21,000 a year, people can, you know, if they hold this belief, they can justify it by saying, well, that means the people in the 1% must have just worked very hard, right? Or um, when we look at that extreme wage growth uh, gap, um, where people's at the 1%, their wages are growing exponentially and the bottom 90% are hardly growing at all, we say, well, I guess they must not be working that hard. But that really breaks down when we look at it. Not, you're saying only 1% of the population is working hard. You're saying that person is working 300 times as hard as someone who is, um, you know, working at a, at a restaurant, some, that person is working 300, 3,000 times as hard as someone who's cleaning a home. Um, you know, it, it really breaks down. And um, I, I can, um, if you go to our website, theprosperityagenda.org, um, you can look at that paper and, and that paper kind of breaks down the, that idea even further um, to say how we can start valuing uh, people who are doing frontline work, people who are, um, you know, being paid low wages. Um, and how it is not a personal uh, personal responsibility issue. It is it is more of a societal issue. Okay, that was a lot. Uh, sorry to lay it on heavy there, um, but so I thought we could take a moment to kind of take a deep breath together. Okay. So this is the tool. Um, so I mentioned I worked in the health field um, and this is a tool from public health um, that I find really, really valuable. This is what got me out of this idea of like the, the personal, the individual. So um, it's called the socio-ecological model. And it says that there is this nested system that is having um, interrelationships with each other. So at the very center of the circle is uh, is individuals, is uh, people. So this is the level of attitudes and beliefs and knowledge and behaviors. And a lot of times our interventions, you know, working in the nonprofit field for a long time, our interventions are happening at this level, saying like, folks need more education, 
or we need to change people's behaviors. We need to, you know, encourage savings. We need to, um, you know, I, people need to spend less, things like that. And, and that really, you know, people's individual personal actions are important and they're just one part of this whole picture. So people exist, um, you know, within interpersonal dynamics. So people's friends and family and your social interactions have a big impact on what that person's attitudes and beliefs and knowledge and behaviors might be. Um, and that's something uh, that's that's really important to, to explore. Um, so if someone is in a relationship and in that relationship, um, you know, one person gets laid off, well, that has, you know, a big effect on what their conversations are going to look like or what their relationship stress is going to look like or what their household management looks like. And then we kind of go to this wider level of institutional. So those folks are maybe having some, um, you know, financial difficulties, especially in this age of coronavirus. Um, and they go to institutions to try to help, you know, so they go to a bank um, to, to, to get some relief, but maybe that bank, you know, they don't feel, it depends, like how are they going to be treated at that bank, right? Is really going to determine, um, you know, how, how they feel and what actions they might take in the future. We did, uh, uh some research in, uh, Minneapolis, um, last year and looking at folks who were unbanked and underbanked and kind of what their experience was going into a, a bank that was offering a similar program to, to bank on. Um, and in that scenario, you know, a lot of people felt like this bank was welcoming, this bank treated them with dignity, uh, that people cared about them, that they had staff that reflected, that looked like them. Um, you know, one woman said it wasn't all just, uh, white guys in like in white button up shirts. Um, and so that, you know, there was this feeling of being at home, you know, she was offered coffee, um, when she came to the bank. So things like that go a long way in affecting people's ability, um, or, or you know, affecting all these other issues. And then we have the level of community. Um, so this is, you know, our social networks, our groups, our places, what, you know, where are institutions situated? How does the community feel about things like financial institutions, right? And we know that there has been, you know, from our last presentation, there's there's a lot of distrust um, and uh, around financial institutions, you know, in many cases, rightly so, because of the, um, you know, discrimination and uh, exclusion that's happened in the past. So, how a community feels about those institutions determines how someone is going to relate to those institutions. And then we've got the, the level of societal. So this is dominant worldviews, just like, you know, we talked about a moment ago with personal responsibility and meritocracy. Those worldviews determine um, how all these different levels interact, right? If the institutions um, have a meritocracy worldview, that's going to influence the kind of products they offer and the kind of service they deliver. Um, if the societal worldview is don't talk about money, that goes all the way down to the personal and the interpersonal. And if someone is struggling, they're not going to ask for help because they think that's shameful. Um, okay. Let me see if there's any questions here in the chat. Amazing. We'll we'll dig into this a little bit further. Um, but this is one of my favorite tools for really breaking beyond that toxic individualism. And we can actually later in in, in this workshop we'll um, explore some interventions at these different uh, at these different levels. So I want to say this is kind of my point from earlier. Individuals suffer from systemic issues. We see the outcomes of these systems at the individual level, and that might look like debt or repossession or eviction, foreclosure, as those things kind of um, a snowball on each other, we can see low credit scores, therefore uh, higher interest rates, it's more expensive to borrow or limited or no ability to borrow, or you know what we're here to discuss today, limited ability perhaps to even get a, a banking or, or checking account. 
But while individuals suffer from systemic issues, addressing these individual issues doesn't fix the system that's caused them. Of course, we need to address these individual issues, right? If people are in debt and their credit score is low, that is having a material effect on their life. And therefore, we want to make sure that someone um, can raise their credit score so it doesn't cost so much to borrow or they can achieve the financial goals they want to achieve. However, doing that by itself won't trickle up. Does that make sense? Like it trickles down, but it doesn't trickle up. Um, there will continue to be um, these 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 issues, these um, effects on the individual if we do not get to kind of a higher level of intervention. And what this model that's been used for years and years in public health says is it's not about one intervention is better than the other, but we need a mix. We, we need a mix and they need to happen simultaneously. So um, I think the the big call to action for this presentation is to think about, you know, where your organization or institution is intervening in the system and how you might um, influence, you know, a level or two levels uh, above what you are currently doing, because we we've got a lot to address in our society. And this moment of, you know, this <laughs> very extended moment of COVID, I think, has given us the opportunity to do so. and the you know, social uprisings around Black Lives Matter and racial equality, you know, is, is giving us this mandate uh, to really do that. Um, and I think more and more people are are ready for this change to, to happen, you know, and we need folks in the institutions um, to take it on. So um, let's get into kind of what, what we can do about this. Um, so we can build on success. Uh, by recognizing how families manage money. So as I mentioned, the prosperity agenda does a lot of whole family approaches. And uh, the core of those whole family approaches is the idea that families are doing really well. Actually, I mean, families are very resilient. They know how to manage money. And there are many things they are successful at. So let's build on that success. Um, and that starts with kind of addressing our own mindset that income and wealth are not evidence of good decisions right? Um, and then therefore, poverty is not the evidence of bad decisions. No one made a series of bad decisions that has, you know, caused, um, you know, that, po that poverty. We looked at wage stagnation. We looked at what the majority of uh, Americans are actually making in terms of wages. The bottom line is people don't have enough money. It's very hard to make a budget. It's very hard to not go into debt when you plain do not have enough money. Um, so, but families experiencing poverty, and this is a lot of firsthand qualitative research that we've done with the prosperity agenda, is that they know how to manage money. Um, if you don't have a lot of money, you have very creative, inventive ways to spend that money um, and to take care of yourself and your family. So we're going to look at some of those uh, a little bit more in depth. So families have savings goals. Um, you know, this is something that's a bit of a, a misnomer sometimes when people say, well, we just need to set goals. And uh, it's a bit uh, missing the point because families um, have goals. Um, if you'll go ahead and advance that slide. Um, so about uh, the, the breaking this down, um, this is some research we did in 2018, 2019. Um, the number one savings goal that people have is to cover a surprise expense or emergency. So exactly kind of what the recommendation is, you know, to be saving money for that emergency fund. Uh, we know it's harder than it looks. Um, and we also know, you know, a, a lot of people, it really determines, uh, depends on what you measure. A lot of folks will measure uh, savings in the bank and say that is the evidence that someone is successful at savings. However, what that misses, um, you know, people should have $400, $500 to be able to cover that surprise expense. Uh, what that misses is, what if someone just used it on an emergency? So their balance is zero. Does that mean they're bad at, at, they're bad at saving? No, that means they're great at saving and they spent it on exactly what it was for, which was a surprise expense or emergency. So we really need to be um, careful and considerate about how we're measuring um, uh, people saving success or how we're measuring success in these situations because we can be um, unintentionally measuring things and then the data looks like people aren't good at saving, but people are actually very good at saving. Um, 
going back to this part, uh, other people's savings goals are around specific purchases like a car or a home. Um, and then about 33% of people are not currently saving money, um, you know, often as a result of just kind of not having that additional disposable income to be putting into savings. Um, families also have savings practices that work. So uh, something that happens, you know, in terms, and we we're just talking about measuring um, success, we tend to measure success as money in the bank. But when we actually talk to families, they had a lot of um, non-financial ways to save money. So purchasing extra items, we talked to uh, a couple people who said they purchased extra diapers um, because that was their thing. They felt like if they had diapers, then they're going to be okay. You know, so they would purchase extra diapers when they had it, purchase extra food when they needed it. Um, collecting change. Um, I talked to a, a woman who had collected a bunch of change and, and put her goal on top of that, like um, kind of five gallon water jug, put her goal on top of it. And it was like trip to Disney, um, Disney World. And they collected their change every day and they talked to their, their kids about it um, and were able to, you know, go on many family vacations um, using that method paying extra on their bills. Um, you know, some of them are financial, putting money in savings or, or hiding cash. Um, and, you know, some other uh, ideas around saving gift cards. We talked to some families who said, I save all the gift cards I get as presents. And then, you know, for a birthday or for a celebration or for a holiday, then we use all those gift cards at once. So, you know, recognizing all the different ways that families are saving money and not assuming that if they don't ha are not saving in the way that we're accustomed to saving, then they're not saving. So families also talk with their children about money. Um, you know, there's a lot of research, a lot of importance around discussing money with children um, and how can we have multi-generation approaches to uh, financial wellness. Um, and this is happening. This is already happening, which is great news. So, you know, 48% of almost half of people are often uh, talking to their kids about money. 20% sometimes, um, you know, going down to 25% never. And I would say that, you know, that that piece around never it is likely that it's hard. You know, as I've kind of restated a couple times, it's difficult for people to talk about money. It feels taboo. It feels uncomfortable. It feels like um, someone's whole identity is up for debate when we talk about money. Um, so I can totally understand that reluctance to, to want to talk about it, especially with kids. Um, our research also showed that, uh, you know, young people are picking up what's going on around money in the home, whether they're having explicit conversations or not. So, you know, kids are listening in to their, um, you know, when the adults in the house are talking, um, kids are paying attention at the store. Kids are, you know, very, very perceptive um, in terms of this. So any ways we can um, make those conversations more explicit and encourage uh, encourage kids to be part of that conversation um, is really wonderful because a lot of people's uh, goals around money have to do with um, their children and, and having, um, you know, making sure that their, their children are, are safe and well taken care of. Um, families think about money constantly, you know, this piece, this piece gets me like 53% of people say that thinking about money consumes my thinking on a daily basis. So what this points out to me is that it's not a knowledge issue. It's not, oh, think about how many lattes you're getting. Think about, you know, the spending decisions. People are thinking about it all the time, um, to the point where you might be in, uh, where you might get to a place of decision fatigue often because you're you're constantly making um, these these micro decisions and these big trade offs around money. Um, I'll, get, I'll I'll share another example. We talked to a woman who said she had to, um, or that there's a Seven Eleven near her house that she can walk to. So she's deciding to get groceries. Where should she go? Seven Eleven is nearby to the house, she can walk, but the prices are a little bit more expensive. Or does she take the car and spend gas money to go to the grocery store that's further away, but the prices are lower, right? So those are the, you know, sophisticated decision making that people are doing on the, on a daily basis. And if we just kind of look at the surface level and say, well, why'd you go to 7-Eleven? The prices are more expensive. We're missing all of the thinking um, that that people are doing. 
Um, okay. That's awesome. I'm just seeing in the chat, uh, you know, Emily sharing about um, wishing people were, the parents talked more about money. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, myself included. I'm one of those persons who just kind of like listened at the door um, to, to kind of what was going on. And, and it was stressful. It was stressful as a kid too, to um, kind of uh, just hear that and, and not sort of um, be included in, in what those financial goals might be. Okay. So reflection moment for everybody. Whew, I believe money. So I kind of want you to, to think about this, maybe put it in the chat if you feel comfortable. Um, what What's your belief about money? We just kind of went through a pretty large section there. Um, what do you believe about money? Go ahead and add that to the chat. Awesome. <laughs> okay, great. Key to security. Um, money is managing both sides of the balance sheet. More problems than solutions. If you don't have money, you'll be shut out of opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Money is a pathway and a tool. It's the means, not the ends. Yeah, absolutely. Money can change your life. Money conversations must be addressed under systemic challenges. Yes. Thank you. That's about that's what we're about to get into um, right now. Money is a major stressor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's get into this next section. Um, so this next section is around seeing power. Um, so I said money creates power. Uh, you know, that might be, that's maybe one of my beliefs about money um, as well. And so uh, let's take a moment to, to kind of look at that. All right. So we've got this uh, classroom um classroom experience kind of wanted to take us back maybe to, to when we were in school um got a, a kid raising their hand we've got other children looking at them um maybe expectantly you know where is the power in this scenario kind of what what might be going on in here who's got the power uh, if you can kind of write in the chat I feel like we might be on a, a bit of a delay as well. So I'll, I'll wait a minute. All right. Alice is saying the teacher. And maybe I'll, I guess maybe be, let me be more specific. Like what power? Who's got the power and what power do they have? So the teacher's got the power to say that's the right answer or that's not the right answer. The teacher's frowning. You know, the, the teacher has the power to, um, you know, really, I mean, they're, they're really in control of that room, right? To say, um, oh, that was a, that was a stupid answer. You didn't do your homework, right? To really embarrass that person. Um, you know, what else? We, we might have, you know, some of these kids in the room might have more power than other. We've got social dynamics in here, right? Like if there are uh, kids who are more popular, right, or more likely to, you know, use, uh, cut someone down with insults, they might have the power. 
Who else? Got hand raised. We might this the person who's raising their hand could be um, they have the power, right? Maybe they're the smartest kid in the room, and they've all this kid has you know always answers correctly, and so they you know might not be giving the other kids an opportunity to share. Okay, kid in the front row might think that the um, the kid raising their hand is dumb. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> get in the front. Don't wrap me up, man. Recess is coming. Um, right. So the teacher has the power to uh, withhold recess, withhold the class. I mean, how many uh, how many people have been late to their next class because the, the the teacher didn't let them out, right? Um, so power dynamics um, running rampant in this, you know, more than meets the eye, more than just a simple, a teacher asks a question, a student is answering the question. All right, let's look at one more. All right, got a pre-COVID situation here in a, in a healthcare setting. Um, who's, who's got the power and what power do they have? We've got a, a doctor scenario, let's see. Um, I would say, so let's say, um, in this scenario too, I want to, I want you to think about, uh, the insurance provider. Oh my God. Thank you, Ryan. That's a great point. I just wanted to go to this place around, um, institutions or community level, uh, norms or, uh, societal level, you know, who's, Who's got the power? I love that. The insurance provider's not even in this picture and they've they've got the power. Okay, I'm being told there is a 30 second delay. So that is good to know. All right, Lynn says the doctor decides what work can be done. The nurse, because she'll be doing the work. Or the CNA. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe even at the hospital level, um, you know, the hospital's trying to cut costs. So we're not going to, you know, we're not going to do what doctors do on TV and try to go the extra mile for someone. Okay. And the patient has power to refuse treatment. Yep. Doctors and nurses have, you know, in a lot of cases, a lot more education and experience in the field, um, using uh, technical terminology uh, that patients might not understand. Yeah, in some surgeries, the patient is unconscious. Absolutely. I mean, we could even say, you know, at a societal level, we don't know what... Um, racial or gender uh, biases or other implicit biases, you know, doctors and nurses might have, um, you know, plenty of evidence and research that says that black women um, are more likely to um, suffer, you know, intense medical issues because doctors don't believe them, um, don't believe their pain. Okay. All right, thank you for participating in this uh, in this exercise. So let's take it to our own system. Um, let's talk about power imbalances in the financial system. Um, <laughs> I'm just reminding myself what this slide was about. Okay, yes. Um, so who has who has power at these different levels, right? If we're, we're thinking about this, who has power in the financial um, in the financial system and what power do they have? I've got a couple examples up here on the screen. Um, so landlords have power over 
renters. Um, banks and credit unions hold the mortgage and hold power over homeowners. Um, you know, banks and credit unions, um, you know, have access to loans and banking products and therefore have power over community members. Uh, you know, we looked at the teacher one. Um, so teacher, you know, in a, in a lot of cases, people, uh, if teachers are assumed to know all of the answers and know the information and be able to judge if someone is right or wrong, um, they've got power over a financial education class. Uh, same with a banker, right? A banker has uh, is assumed to have all of this financial information and therefore, and no right and wrong. And in a lot of cases, that that's probably true because there are technical issues. Um, but in that banking conversation, that person doesn't feel like they're coming to the situation with the same level uh, of knowledge or power. Um, other examples that you want to highlight, you know, this, this was really, this is the call to action kind of portion uh, is let's spot these power imbalances in the financial system so that we can do something about them. Okay, I'll give myself that, give all of us that 30 second delay. Any other ones you want to raise? I'm not seeing them in the chat yet. All right, Jared's saying the government. Yeah, tell me more about the government. I mean, setting interest rates, setting some of these safety net protections that we were talking about. Yeah, at the societal level, uh-huh. Yeah, I mentioned, you know, our work at the Prosperity Agenda, uh, we work with a lot of different government agencies who uh, who administer um, TANF and SNAP and, you know, um, WIOA, like trainings, cash benefits, things like that. And they have the power to determine what is required for those, um, what's the eligibility, what is required for those um, different social safety net programs. And you know, a lot of the folks we work with at the institutional level have the power to decide how much of those things, like where can we bend to make a better experience for people? And where can we work on our interpersonal, um, you know, at the conversation level, at the coaching level to um, make sure that we're treating people with dignity and respect and as partners in this work, um, which may be different from how uh, the societal government expectations are setting things up. All right, Ryan is saying, friends and family, the advice that you're hearing before going into a financial institution or financial class. Yeah, absolutely. The, you know, I would say that at the community or the societal level, what are those dominant worldviews? Um, or at the friends and family level, you know, what are you hearing about X bank or X credit union? What are you hearing about um, Banks in general, you know, what has been your what has been your parents' uh, experience? What has been your grandparents' ex, uh, experience? Um, is really huge in determining someone's willingness uh, to to engage and and how they'll engage um, with those organizations. Yep, Jared is saying societal values are represented in laws. Absolutely. Um, what laws are passed and whose interests they protect. Yep, that's a really great point, right? It At that uh, societal, at that laws policy level, you know, who did the uh, the CARES Act? Who did that most benefit? Um, and who did it leave out? All right, excellent uh, brainstorm there. Okay, so um, in terms of addressing these power imbalances, uh, the first thing to do was to notice them. And the second thing um, 
you can do as a provider, whether you work in a financial institution or whether you work in a um, community-based organization, you can listen to people's financial needs. Um, so not assuming what they need, but really saying what's going on for you, um, what's coming up for you, what are the conversations that you're having, um, and then seeing what you have to offer that can meet those financial needs, right? Just not a not doing this kind of one size fits all approach. And really, and the second thing is recognizing that a lot, a lot of people have financial shame um, and have been taught that you don't talk about money, that you don't talk about when you're struggling with money. Um, and what you can do to, what, what can be a salve for that is um, non-judgmental conversations and questions. Someone, you can make it a norm that it's okay to talk about money and then it's okay to um, have money stress. Uh, it's okay to um, ask questions about money. That doesn't mean that you have failed as an individual. That doesn't mean you aren't successful. Um, everyone goes through this, you know? Actually, the majority of people have um, financial questions and experience financial stress. So let's get through this together. Um, reducing that money shame, um, reducing that money shame means people can ask for help when they need it. Too many people, uh, don't talk about money or, or, or feel so much shame that they don't ask for help until it is too late. Um, and you know, the condition has, uh, the situation has snowballed, um, or something very, uh, some worse things have happened. Right. Um, so we want people to ask for help. Uh, as soon as possible and feel like there is someone on their side um, who they can ask for help um, or be an intermediary or point them in the direction of a financial institution that they trust. Just like Ryan said, you know, that friends and family connection. Who, what you hear about uh, banks and financial institutions has makes a really, really big deal or is a really big deal. Um, we did a project with uh, immigrant and refugee, uh, immigrant and refugee families um, in South King Camp County and um, what was really important in that is the connection between the financial institution and the community-based organization. So the community-based organization was running financial education classes. And what they did was invite someone from a financial institution to come sit in on those classes, answer those more technical questions, um, and just be a face that people can recognize. And they can um, you know, build that relationship, start to rebuild that trust uh, with community members. Um, and that led to you know, a uh, significant increase in people signing up for uh, bank accounts or accessing those financial products or just feeling comfortable going into a financial institution. Um, and then uh, secondly, connecting people to the most relevant information for them. Um, a lot of our research or, you know, in part, this research was done with uh, a group of apprentices who are um, working in the trades and uh, actually a group called Anu, who's really fantastic training um, women um, to go into the trades like electrician and, and plumbing and things like that. Um, and they were going through this training program, they weren't getting paid, but in six months they were about to experience a pretty big increase in their incomes. Um, so they didn't need to know um, about, you know, making a budget or, you know, right now wasn't the thing that they needed. You know, um, so really the timing is super important to people um, and connecting people to the relevant information because that is what they can actually use. And what else can we do um, as a financial institution? You know, acknowledge those mistakes and distrust, you know, not assuming that people um, automatically uh, know that that uh, things are are trustworthy. Um, focus on access and belonging. Some of the stories I shared earlier around making sure that you're, um, I know we're not in person very often anymore, but making sure that's a welcoming experience. You know, if you have bank on, uh, if you have accounts that meet the bank on standards, making sure that all of your employees know about that. Um, that was something that, that was the case in Minneapolis where there was, you know, a bank on like, uh, product and some of the, the sales associates, like, People said that when the sales associates knew what that bank account was without trying to treat it as sort of this like separate second class kind of thing, that increased their feeling of belonging. 
that made them feel like, oh, people know what's going on. This is a legitimate bank account. And this isn't just some offshoot special program that like I have to be transferred to three different people to find out about, right? Thinking through all those different ways, like if we can focus on belonging, you know, what happens? What, what actions would we take if our goal is belonging? Uh, being transparent um, about fees, about um, expectations, anything that folks might need to do, um, and offering people what they need. So, you know, that can look like community conversations. That can look like partnering with community-based organizations to really get a deeper understanding of the products um, or services that, that uh, are most relevant to people. Okay. Let's do a reflection moment. Um, what can I change or inspire? What can you change or inspire when it comes to um, uh, financial wellness? So um, feel free to put this in the chat. You know, I think they mentioned in the chat, you know, these PowerPoints will be available for everybody. And um, uh, yeah, I would encourage you to kind of think through these questions with your team. Um, I hope to provide some, you know, some ideas, some pathways. Um, and and these are really, these are deep questions that you can, um, you know, that warrant longer discussions. Um, and and it will be wonderful to see what to see what folks come up with. Okay, let's go on. Um, just got about 10 more minutes here. Um, um, so I want to introduce you to, um, you know, I shared that we have a, a product called Money Mindset Cards um, that we developed based on all of this research with folks um, who are experiencing financial insecurity. And so, um, the, this is an option, you know, you can use these cards, um, in, in a variety of different ways. Um, but really their, their main purpose is to start non-judgmental conversations about money. Um, they are 30 unique conversation cards, conversation starters that are designed specifically to reduce shame and anxiety about money, to be responsive to real people's needs, build on people's financial strengths. Um, and for the facilitator, have these conversations with ease, with a sense of joy, even with a sense of fun, um, and focus and understand what is most relevant uh, to people. Because you're you're having a conversation that is flowing and landing on the the topics that are most important to people. Uh, we found that they increase confidence and action amongst uh, in our evaluation of the cards. Um, people have a sense, uh, increased feeling of financial control, uh, an increased feeling of social connection. Um, a lot of folks were mentioning in the chat um, that, you know, feeling this idea, the idea of financial shame, right, is that you're alone and that you will be um, not worthy of belonging because you have failed in this financial setting. But when people start talking about their finances in a, in a group setting or even, you know, one on one with a coach, People say, oh, there are other people like me. And because people have had success, um, because people are very good at managing their money, hey, there are other people who are like me who are succeeding. And that gives me um, hope and inspiration and ideas about how um, I, can, I can take some action as well. And what we've seen is increased use of financial services as well. So I know that that's, um, you know, a main uh, a goal of, of our work here with Bank On. 
In terms of organizations, uh, we've seen um, uh, community-based organizations and financial institutions develop these stronger partnerships and relationships um, and reduce biases and assumptions about financial behaviors. Um, the more conversations you have, the more, you know, the more data kind of gets put into uh, uh, your system. And it's like, oh, wow, I didn't know that the majority of Americans are making $21,000 a year, right? And that can really start to, to reorganize how we think um, or how we see the outcomes um, that people are experiencing right now. And we can see, uh, and uh, therefore, higher empathy um, for different financial experiences. Um, so organizations can be, uh, or, or, or the cards can be used in organizations for training purposes or directly uh, with participants or with community members. Uh, so some feedback we've gotten on them is that they're simple and engaging ways to start conversations. Uh, people let their guard down and explore attitudes towards money. They give people an opportunity to breathe. And the conversations among participants start more easily and conversations grow more organically. Um, I used to teach high school and uh, it was very difficult sometimes to like have a conversation and get that conversation going and uh, get it going in a way where people were excited to share, you know, the whole lesson was kind of uh, built on the Socratic method and we want, you know, people to be sharing their experiences. Um, and if you've taught any classes, you know, sometimes like you just have a group that is not, <laughs> does not want to talk. Um, and so uh, it's very valuable to, to have an opportunity or very valuable to have a tool that like gets conversation going and gets people excited to talk. Uh, very lastly, kind of to conclude here, um, is to envision financial wellness, you know, a world where everyone is safe and cared for. Um, I think we'll kind of speed through this just because of time, but uh, I guess this is our last brainstorm, is how can we ensure that everyone is safe and cared for, that we live in this world of uh, financial wellness? Oh, I don't have to speed, that's good news. Okay, cool, we'll do this then, we'll do the brainstorm. How can we ensure that everyone is safe and cared for? And I want us to think about the socio-ecological model um, on these different levels. What can we do? Um, and this you know, doesn't necessarily have to be your commitment, but this is a brainstorm. This is what can we do um, to really change this system of, of uh, finan finances. All right, so I'll let folks put that in the chat. And there's some examples here on the screen as well. I just currently monsooning here in Seattle. Um, so I hope that isn't picking up too much on my sound, but um, yeah, go ahead and um, put in the chat. We've got some examples here, you know, on the personal level of attitudes, beliefs, knowledge, behaviors. I mean, I feel like we're good at this one, right? Like coming from an education background, in the health field, we're great around what knowledge do you need? I want to share this information. Um, you know, we can kind of take that to another level by exploring our money mindset, um, using those money mindset cards. Um, we talked about on the interpersonal level, uh, building relationships with community groups. Um, so really reaching out to financial institutions, reaching out to who are the trusted institution. You know, if you're a financial institution, reaching out to the trusted community-based organizations who have deep relationships uh, with, with the community. Um, uh, 
at the institutional level, um, you know, there are many uh, known ways to, you know, close the racial wealth gap. Um, issuing baby bonds. Many different cities are looking at this. Um, you know, investing in affordable housing, offering products that we bank on. Um, at the community level, really asking community to co-design. Um, there's a wonderful article around uh, Berkshire Bank in Massachusetts that uh, hired a community organizer to um, be on staff. And the community organizer was holding kind of these community listening sessions with folks who were unbanked and underbanked to say, what are the products that you need? Especially right now with COVID, what folks need right now is going to be way different than what they needed seven months ago. Um, and at the societal level, really noticing and naming and questioning these dominant beliefs around money that we talked about, personal responsibility, toxic individualism, uh, meritocracy, you know, and it's, those are so ingrained. They're in every TV show and movie and they're in, you know, um, they are embedded into, into how we've lived and it's no, and they're in me too. So it's around, um, you know, when they show up in our work, inevitably, how do we question those and how do we say, Hey, I feel like that's, you know, an individualistic belief. How might we switch that? And how might we look at things from a more interpersonal or institutional or societal level? Um, let me look to the chat and see what, what folks are saying. Ryan saying, making sure people with decisions, um, lived experience, um, oh, sorry. Making sure people making the decisions at each of these levels have lived experience in the issues. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if that has big hiring implications, um, both at community-based organizations, financial institutions. Care for those around us by voting, by being advocates. I mean, absolutely, connecting with organizations who are policy, you know, policy advocates. Um, that's huge. Not all of our, um, you know, community-based organizations have a, a policy or advocacy wing. But can we make a, a can we make a strategic partnership? Can we form some relationships um, with those organizations who are advocacy-based, so we can get things like fifteen-dollar minimum wage, so we can get things um, like foreclosure and eviction prevention uh, policies so we can get more money for small business relief. Engage the community. Absolutely. Yeah, there's this really gorgeous, like <laughs> symbiotic relationship um, that we see based on this research um, with community based organizations and financial institutions. Um, you know, a lot of community based organizations um, taking it upon themselves to have these very deep financial conversations. And it's stressful for the facilitators of that because we feel like we need to be experts. Um, and, you know, our offering to you is that you don't need to be an expert. Um, you need to open up the conversation and kind of be a trustworthy person and then connect with a financial institution or connect with financial coaches or financial counselors who can do that very technical work, um, you know, uh, of getting that information out there. But but really building that relationship um, is, is is super important um, and can you know reap these benefits for everybody. Um, Beth is saying exploring where money mindsets come from and the internalized and dominant perspective or paradigm and narrative. Absolutely. Yeah, and so the money mindset cards, a lot of them talk about, you know, what are your beliefs and where do they come from? And opening up that conversation and saying, you know, what do your friends believe about money? What does your family believe about money? How were you raised? What, what did you grow up maybe in, you know, explicitly or implicitly learning about money? Pushing for living wages, absolutely. You know, after doing a lot of this research on living wage work, I'm like the fight for, I'm like 20, 25, you know, like 15 almost doesn't seem like enough. Um, and, you know, I, I signed up for that campaign and, and get text alerts about um, kind of what they're doing um, as well. And it would be, it would be a massive win, you know, to, to be able to raise that federal minimum wage. Um, ah, I love this, Beth, to have the class of participants co-create a new narrative. Yes. Yeah, it's really identifying what that new narrative is and then practicing using that one. Um, 
we did some work around uh, um, growth mindset, fixed mindset. And, and when folks were thinking about growth mindset, they were actually reminding themselves. One woman said, hey, oh, I recognize that that's a fixed mindset kind of perspective. If I was using a growth mindset, how would I think about this situation differently? And she was actually like coaching herself, which was so cool. Yep, lowering property taxes and making mortgages more available. Love these ideas. Um, to wrap up, I just want to share that you can um, practice using money mindset cards. They're available on our website. Um, you can go to moneymindsetcards.org. Um, we have three cards that are uh, up and available free for use. Um, and you can also purchase the full deck of 30 physical cards. Um, if you purchase a free deck or if you purchase a physical deck, we can also probably send you a virtual PDF deck to be using during COVID times. And I'm going to skip that one. Um, yeah. Lastly, to say, if you have ideas about how or you have questions about how you might use money mindset cards in your work or how you might use any of um, or have the kind of conversations or or make some of these changes in your team or um, organization or, or how to develop this, um, I would love to have a conversation about that. So um, please connect with me. I'm uh, Sylvia at the prosperity agenda dot org. Um, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I would love to connect or, or come over to um, our website at theprosperityagenda.org. Um, thank you so much for your time and participation. This was um, an incredible opportunity to, to get to connect with you, even in this small chat way. Um, all right, so I am going to turn this over to Will, I believe, All right, turn it over to Becky, I think, for a quiz. Thanks, everyone. Good morning, everybody. Here, here we are again. Um, I hope you guys are all enjoying this morning session. I definitely am. These conversations have been so motivational and just, uh, it's amazing. I, it's a great, great lineup today. So, and yesterday, I shouldn't just say today. Um, so guess what time it is? And yes, we are going to do a little quiz again. But first, I want to announce that we had actually one winner of yesterday's quiz. One person nailed it 100% all the questions. Um, so congratulations to Rachel Hill of SPIPA, the South Puget Intertribal Planning Agency. Rachel, if you are here today, I will be reaching out to you. Um, so here comes some more of our questions to uh, to kind of run through today. Let's see what we got. Which, the first one here, which of the following most influences our credit scores? Either getting divorced, having a credit application denied, a drop in salary, or none of the above. There we go. So A, B, C, or D. Let's see here. I'm trying to move mine. Now I'm having technical difficulties. There we go. All right. Okay, let's go on to number two. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to put the answers in there first. So the answer is D, actually. None of the above technically influence your credit score. So getting a divorce in and of itself doesn't impact the credit score. Um, it could potentially, you know, if there's damage or, you know, loss of income or things that go along with divorce, um, having a credit application denied itself doesn't necessarily influence the, the credit score. The application, just whether it's approved or denied, can definitely influence a score. Um, a drop in salary, again, doesn't really change it, but it 
could, if you could, you know, no longer continue to make payments on time, that can cause uh, an issue too. So basically the answer is not D, none of the above. Looks like a couple people, uh, Lorraine got that right. So that's awesome. Um, okay, let's see our next question. You have more than one credit score. A, true or B, false? Any ideas on that one? This just happens to be one that drives me crazy. Okay, so A, true or B, false. There we go. Looks like Jennifer came in quick with that answer. Yeah, absolutely, the answer is true. We definitely have more than one credit score. It's based on the, the credit reporting agency whose credit report is being reviewed and the credit model of whoever is the actual, you know, who you've made the application for. So it could be an auto lender, it could be a mortgage lender, it could be a credit card company. I mean, there's a, a million different options. Um, there's a lot of different scores, FICO score, uh, Vantage score are two of the probably most talked about scores. Um, okay. Oh, I didn't even click to the yes or the, the true or the false answer, but here is the true or the false answer. Okay, so we're gonna go to number three. Let's see. Generally, which of the following most influences uh, your credit scores? The types of payments, excuse me, the types of credit accounts you have, your payment history, B, your payment history, C, the amount of credit you are using compared to the total available to you, or D, the length of your credit history. So we've got A, the types of credit accounts you have, B, the payment history, C, the total amount of credit you're using compared to the total amount available to you, or D, the length of your credit history. Let's see, we got B. Lots of bees coming in. You guys feeling confident about those bees? Look at all those bees. You guys are awesome. That's exactly right, right? Your payment history. Do we pay our bills on time? That's the most important factor when it comes to our credit reports and our credit scores. Okay, let's look at, see, I keep forgetting to flip to the answer. That's okay, we got it. So let's look at the next one. We've got uh, four, getting married changes your credit scores. A, true, or B, false. A, true, or B, false. Getting married changes your credit scores. Here we go. There comes a bunch of B's and B is the answer. We Everybody's credit is still individual even after you get married. They might look at both of those um, when you get married if you want to buy something together and you're looking to use both of the party's credit, but it's still completely separated. All right, good job you guys. Um, let's take a look here. Number five. Do good credit scores guarantee you'll be approved for credit? A, yes they do, or B, no they don't. It often seems like that's all people talk about is our credit scores. So do the credit scores guarantee we'll be approved for credit? A, yes they do, or B, no they don't. All right, look at you guys again. 
Amazing answers. Yep. Um, no, they don't guarantee. So when we're looking at credit, there is there kind of, sometimes I feel like there really is a magic number. Um, but <clears throat> it depends on who the lender is and it depends on what they're looking at. But the other thing is there's always um, our income. That's that's part of that factor. Right. There's the you have your capacity, your collateral, your character, uh, your credit. Those are all different pieces that go into making a decision about whether or not someone's going to be approved for credit. So, uh, no, a good credit score is not the only thing that a creditor is going to look at to determine whether or not we qualify. All right. And let's see here. Number six, what is a FICO score? A, it's one of many types of credit scores. B, it's how much of your credit you're currently using compared to the total amount that's available to you. Um, C, it is how many times you've recently applied for credit. Or D, it's how many times you've made a payment late or missed a payment. Man, Caitlin was quick on the draw there. It's the answer is A. It is one of many types of uh, a credit score. It's, it is the most widely used credit score when it comes to lending. Um, but even within a FICO score, there are several different variations of that FICO score. Um, you know, we have a FICO 2, there's a FICO 4, there's a, uh, we have just, they just came out this year with the FICO 10 and the FICO 10T. Um, the FICO 8 is probably the most widely used scoring model, but then even within there, there's variations based on whether it's a score for auto lending, a score for mortgage lending, which typically they don't use 8, um, or a score for, um, you know, a consumer credit card, uh, there's the score that they show us as a, you know, the general person, lay person coming in to look at their score. So there's a lot. There really are a lot of variations of the scores out there. OK, I think we might have time for one last question here. Um, number seven, your credit scores are calculated using information from a background check, um, your friends and neighbors. C, information on credit reports, or D, your employer? I think this one will probably be pretty straightforward. So again, your credit scores are calculated from your background check, your friends and your neighbors, information in your credit report, or D, your employer. All right. You guys are on it. See, number seven, the answer is C, information in your credit reports. So credit scores are calculated based on the information that's in that credit report. That's what generates that number that, you know, how risky or how not risky um, we are. So it's that black and white information that's written out. That's what generates our scores. All right, you guys. Well, I think we're going to hand it over to Will and um, that is it. Thanks for playing this afternoon. Ah, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks to Sylvia Raskin for sharing the money mindset cards and helping us explore our money beliefs. It's time for a short break to stretch and refresh. But first, I want to introduce myself and leave you with uh, thoughts and a question before you go. My name is Will Oberst, and I'm on the board of Jumpstart Washington. Jumpstart, the S is spelled with the dollar symbol. Uh, because Jumpstart Washington is a nonprofit organization that seeks to promote the personal finance literacy for Washingtonians, primarily uh, young Washingtonians. We are a coalition, one of several throughout the country, uh, comprised of individuals, nonprofit, government agencies, and the corporate sector who have joined together to improve the personal finance, financial literacy of Washington youth. 
Uh, Jumpstart's purpose is to evaluate the financial literacy of young adults, develop, disseminate, encourage the use of standards for grades K through 12, and promote the teaching of personal finance. The Jumpstart Coalition believes that all young adults need to have the financial literacy necessary to make informed financial decisions. Many young people fail in the management of their first consumer credit experience, establish bad financial management habits, and stumble through their lives learning by trial and error. The Coalition's direct objective is to encourage curriculum enrichment to ensure that basic personal financial management skills are obtained during the K through 12 education. One step. During the break, I'll be showing a short film on financial inclusion that focuses on the barriers and solutions to being unbanked in Washington State. The film was produced by student filmmakers at Heritage University in Topanish, Washington. Oh, neat. The question I want to leave you with during your break for you to consider. What is the most important thing high school students should know about money before graduating? When we return, we will learn more about tax season 2020, puzzles, promises, and pitfalls. Hey, can you ring me up real quick, please? Just the burger for you? Yeah, just the burger. Your total is 153. Would that be debit or credit? Here you go. Cash machine is currently broken. We're only accepting debit or credit. Well, I only have cash. You're saying I can buy my food right now? Ruben, why don't you have a bank account? Well, I mean, they always have hidden fees. I don't know how it really works. I don't really trust them with my money. Banks are great. You're technically unbanked right now. Unbanked? Yeah, unbanked. Classified as unbanked? Yes, which means that you're an individual without an account at a bank or any financial institution. So, am I really the only one that doesn't have a bank account this time around? No, you with 22% of U.S. households don't actually have bank accounts. Wow, so I'm really not the only one. I mean, I'm just afraid. What if I put all my life savings and they just take it away with all the hidden fees? Our mission is to be able to support you to access support for effective and related services, products, and other resources. Okay, I like what you're telling me, but what is BankCon? BankCon is a national movement to help people without bank accounts access affordable financial services, including checking, savings, credit, and financial education. So you're really going to help me with all that? Yes, because Bank on Washington is a major initiative of the Financial Empowerment Network. Okay, so now I have a better understanding. So right now without a bank account, I'm considered to be unbanked. And with Bank on, they can help me and other people without bank accounts have access to affordable financial services. Finally, Bank on will teach me a lot about financial education. Thank you, Bank on. With your help, I was able to open up my very first bank account. Of course, Ruben. I was glad I was able to help you open up your bank account.
Welcome back, everybody. Um, I am excited to introduce our next two speakers today, Jenny Romick and Terrence Cabello. Jenny Romick is a professor of social welfare at the University of Washington School of Social Work and faculty director of the West Coast Poverty Center. She studies resources and economic well-being in families with an emphasis on low-income workers, household budgets, and family interactions with the public policy. Her recent projects include research into effective marginal tax rates created by means-tested benefit schedules and the tax system, and mixed method evaluations of the Seattle paid safe and sick time ordinance and $15 an hour minimum wage. She co-leads the Academy, the American Academy of Social Work and, and Social Welfare's Grant Challenges Initiative and co-chairs a national research network on poverty, employment and self-sufficiency through the collaborative of US Poverty Centers. Terrence is a program coordinator at United Way of King County. He focuses on tax site operations as well as supporting volunteers for the campaign. He conducts community outreach, provides logistical support for site managers and AmeriCorps members. Before his current position, he was an AmeriCorps VISTA with the Free Tax Preparation Campaign. He spent six years in active and reserve role in the U.S. Army Military Intelligence Branch of the Department of Defense, expanding governmental programs that help vulnerable communities worldwide. He also worked in human resources at Asian Counseling Referral Services, empowering social workers to help the community with culturally appropriate services. Terrence received a BA from the Western Washington University and a Master of Nonprofit Leadership and a U.S. Army Commission from Seattle University. Welcome. Hey, Jenny, I think you're muted. Ah, all right. Um, for those of you who can't read lips, um, hello and welcome. I'm Jenny Romick from the University of Washington um, School of Social Work and the West Coast Poverty Center. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the session here on tax year 2020 puzzles, promises, and pitfalls for asset building. Um, before we get started, though, I'd like to give thanks to Becky for the introduction and to Alice and Ryan and the, the whole crew at Bank On um, who put this together. So, um, and I'd also like to um, introduce my co-presenter here, Terrence. Hello, and I'm Terrence Kiabiao. Um, very excited to be here. Special thanks to the Bake On Group for allowing this platform to give us uh, this opportunity to talk about finances and asset building. All right, great. Um, well, thank you here. And I know we're, a lot of us have our minds in election season and Halloween right now. I've got kids, so I um, um, enjoy thinking about the latter more than the former right now. Um, but before long, it's going to be tax season. And part of what we're here today to talk about is the role that tax season plays in the lives of low and moderate income families and the potential it has um, for asset building. And like 2020 has been an unusual year, um, this will be an unusual year for tax returns. Uh, next slide, please, Terrence. Okay, um, I'd like to get started though. I see uh, chats coming in here um, and I'd like to warm you all up with a chat. What comes to your mind when you think about um, doing your taxes? Let's, let's have some words um, come up in the chat. Um, all right, we're hearing, I dread it, I'll have to pay. What else? What do you think of the process?
scary, confusing. These, these things are very true. Anxiety, grueling, stressful, uncertain. Yeah, somebody says, I feel like I'm missing things. Um, <laughs> shout out to the math nerd who enjoys it. Um, expensive, overwhelming. Yeah, next time, yeah, frustration. I get half the amount I used to, harder than it has to be. Absolutely. We'll see some more comments come in. Um, but for you all and um, for all tax filers, it's about logistics and paperwork, um, but it's also a time about thinking and trying to understand things and having feelings. You know, one of the first things that popped up here was scary and stressful. Um, people also, you know, will wonder about, um, will I get a refund or will I owe? Um, I just want to get it over with. Um, if you do get a refund, the question is how much will I get or what can I do with that money or how much will I owe and what will that, how will I get that money to, to pay for it? So um, these things are all true. Um, and when we think about low income families, um, there's a similar range of emotions. Um, but for many families, uh, tax time is a very substantial uh, financial event. So next slide, please. Um, I've always um, liked the math aspect, um, like the math nerd who, who chimed in here. I've liked that part of it. Um, but my experience of taxes, particularly early in life um, was that I generally owed taxes. And I started um, talking to families with kids about how they felt about taxes, low income workers, low wage workers. Um, and one of the things that struck me was somebody who I was talking to probably in the late 1990s in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, who said, I can't, I tell people I can't wait till January. And when they ask why, it's so I can file my taxes. And for me, that was a surprise. Um, and as I started to learn more about it, I learned um, about the role that tax time plays in low income families' lives. Um, for low wage workers with kids, tax, the uh, federal tax system is one of our primary ways of redistributing income, of ensuring adequate income for families. So this graph here um, shows a family that makes about $21,000 a year. Um, oh, you actually can't, can't see the access, but um, the, all the, the monthly amounts there are about $1,750 per month, $1,700 per month. In Washington state, this might be a single parent working 20 to 30 hours a week at minimum wage. In other states with lower minimum wages, it would be a full-time worker earning $1,050 an hour. Um, at this level of monthly income, families' expenses may very well be more than their earnings. Um, in many parts of the country, $1,700 a month is not enough for market rate rent or a market rate apartment would take up much of that housing. And even with housing, it would be a stretch to pay for all the other family necessities on that budget. Transportation, clothes for kids, phone bills, toiletries, um, all those family essentials would take up the full range of income, um, and there wouldn't be any money left to save for emergencies. And that's why tax time can be a really substantial time. So if you could click please, Terrence. Um, depending on circumstances, uh, a low wage family, a low wage single parent with two kids might get a combined tax return um, that could be, um, as much as seven or eight thousand dollars, and so for this example family here, um, February would be a very different financial month. It would be a month where they would have typical earnings, um, but would also get a substantial tax return. Next slide, please. A big part of that is the earned income tax credit. Other parts contribute to this large refund, including the child tax credit and withholding, um, but the most important part is the earned income tax credit. 
This graphic here shows the relationship between how much a family tax filer earns and the amount of their credit. So on the bottom, you see earned income. So the five means they earn $5,000 a year, 10 is $10,000 a year and so on. Um, for a parent earning $20,000 a year, if you go up, you see the amount of the earned income tax credit. Uh, for a parent with one qualifying child, the earned income tax credit for this tax year, the maximum amount is $3,500, $3,584. Um, it's almost $6,000 with two qualifying kids, and it's $6,600 um, with three or more qualifying children. Um, layered on top of this, families may also have had withholding in their tax return that they would get back. Um, they might have some child tax credit or some credit for child care expenses. So because this is such um, an important financial amount, it's really important to make sure families claim the EITC and file taxes. And it's particularly important in Washington State. Next slide, please, Terrence. Washington State has one of the most regressive tax systems in the country. I understand that um, thanks to the internet, not everyone at the Bank on Washington conference is from Washington, but many of you are, uh, as, as um, you are otherwise ignore, um, involved in, in Bank on. Um, and our ta state tax system, as, as this graphic from our colleagues at All In for Washington show, is upside down. Low-income families pay a bigger percentage of their income than higher income families because our state tax revenue comes from property tax and comes from sales tax. A family making less than $21,000 a year pays an estimated 16% of their income in taxes, um, whether that is directly through property tax if they own a home or indirectly through their rent being higher because of property tax, and also 10% on everything they buy. If you buy a $10 package of diapers, you pay $11 for it in Washington state. Um, and that means a 10% tax on, on family essentials. So going back to um, the next slide, please, Terrence. And you could just click, click. Yeah, thanks. Um, going back to thinking about the role that tax returns play for low wage families, um, tax time is a time when families can get ahead, particularly families who have very tight budgets most of the rest of the year. Um, the earned income tax credit and tax return in general operates like forced savings. So families use the EITC uh, to pay for delayed basic needs, uh, to pay off credit card bills, um, to put some emergency savings in place, and for social inclusion. It might be the one time of the year where they can take their kids um, to a restaurant that their kids' friends have talked about, or take the family uh, to the movies or um, whatever the COVID era equivalent will be of, of some kind of way to participate in the larger culture um, for kids. Tax time can also be a time to connect to financial institutions. Um, and indeed financial institutions and having a bank to put your um, tax return into, having an account where your tax return can be automatically transferred, um, and so on are, are important aspects of tax time. Um, so tax time has a lot of potential benefits for low wage families, but there's some drawbacks to the system as well. Um, and I think that the, um, the next slide please, Terrence, looks like some of the comments are already anticipating that. Um, claiming the EITC is high, um, over 85% of eligible families um, seemingly eligible families file tax returns and claim the EITC, but not everyone gets it, which means there's some families out there who could potentially benefit from it, but don't. Um, lots of people get their taxes uh, prepared by a commercial tax firm. Um, one of the comments uh, that you all sent in noted that somebody says, you know, I have to use a CPA because of how confusing it all is. Uh, and lots of people feel like that. It's confusing. It's stressful. They don't want to make a mistake. Uh, they want to go someplace where they feel like there's more expertise. However, commercial tax preparers 
um, often charge pretty high fees for that um, for preparation work that in some ways is really pretty simple in a lot of cases. Um, and they're also not always fully transparent in the fees that they charge or in the way that they encourage um, short-term high interest rates. You notice here Liberty Tax Service promises America's fastest refunds and they're happy to hook you up with a bank account through their bank account, through a financial relationship they have if you don't already have a bank account. So commercial preparers um, can charge a lot. They can erode the value of people's taxes. It's not always clear because someone's walking out with $5,000 and they don't necessarily realize that they would have walked out with $6,000 or $5,500 if they didn't. Um, and these drawbacks of, of the tax return system are some of the reasons why we have volunteer tax programs. So, um, and in King County at least, our longstanding volunteer tax program is run by my colleagues at United Way. So I'll let Terrence explain a bit more about VITA and that work. Thank you so much for the, the lead up to uh, VITA, Jenny. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and move this to the next slide. All right, so uh, what is VITA and what exactly is that? So the slide that I have here is just some pictures of our program. Um, these are all our volunteers in various places um, in our, in our VITA program, but essentially on a very high level, um, this program is designed to offer free tax help to qualified individuals. Uh, qualified individuals are folks who meet a certain income limit. Uh, some people have disabilities, some people have uh, limited English capabilities, and some sites specialize in questions for people who are uh, 60 years old or older. So they ask, they will ask questions about pensions and retirement. But in a nutshell, uh, VITA focuses on giving free tax help to a lot of people who are experiencing very high barriers. And we do it with, a, you know, with smiles on our faces. And, and you can see from our volunteers uh, on this slide, they really enjoy the work and um, they're very friendly and our clients uh, do enjoy getting to meet them um, every year. Um, one of the biggest takeaways is uh, that VITA programs are very reliable and they're a trusted source for preparing tax returns. Um, and the reason why VITA is very successful is because every volunteer who is in the program must take tax law training and be certified by the IRS. The tax law training will certify the volunteers on confidentiality, privacy, and tax law. And each client who gets their tax return gets to participate in a quality review process, uh, which is unique to like if you go to an H and R Block or a Hewitt Packard, like they they don't have a quality review process. You just give them money, they do your tax returns, and they submit it for you. Um, each of our volunteers that you can see on this picture here, they're all certified. Uh, we're in our program. We certify everybody on the advanced level. Uh, they get. Um, uh, they get training on everything that is new in the next coming year. And we have a bunch of people who are returning volunteers. So they always, we have a lot of institutional knowledge that comes to us every year for this program. One of the biggest uh, focus points of VITA is raising the taxpayers' awareness of credits like the earned income tax credit we just spoke about earlier. Um, according to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, in 2017, the average earned income credit was $3,191. Uh, so you can see that this is a significant amount of money that can impact, that, that has impact to lift people up in this economy, especially during these times with COVID-19. And lastly, just in terms of VITA and what I wanted to provide in this forum is that it was in 2007, uh, Congress, uh, for, that was uh, the time that Congress first appointed appropriated funds to the IRS to establish and administer a grant program for community volunteer tax as assistance. And their object objectives was to enable VITA sites to reach underserved populations, increase capacity to file returns electronically, heighten quality control, enhance volunteer training. So there's organizations like me who are able to get funding from the IRS to enhance our program in those those particular um, areas of the objectives that um, that the IRS is uh, is targeting, like making sure that we're able to serve underserved populations, with a big smile on our face, of, of course, like mm -hmm. our volunteers that's hosted on here. 
So let's step a little closer to the layout of VITA and how that looks like. So the IRS, they offer the certifications and the training for our volunteers. And VITA locations are where people go to get their taxes done and where our volunteers actually go to do, do the work. And there's several um, options and, and models of how VITA is delivered into our community. So the, the main one is, co is considered the traditional VITA. So back in the day, um, before all the shutdowns with COVID-19, we operated hard walk-in sites. So here at United Way of King County, we had, we had 33 sites across King County and people waited in lines, uh, people filled out the paperwork in person and they got connected with a volunteer in person uh, and running a site like that requires overhead. So you need pens, papers, printed materials, laptops, printers there at the sites. Uh, with COVID-19, uh, some of these traditional uh, sites has evolved to a, a drop-off model. So with safety in mind, folks will just drop off their tax return materials to a volunteer or people will wait in their car and there's like a drive-by model. Another model is called the facilitated self-assistance. So um, some programs can elect to have like a computer lab where clients will go to and there will be one or two people of volunteers that are certified in tax law that's there to provide guidance and mentorship. Uh, the taxpayer themselves will be doing it themselves on their computers, asking questions when needed, uh, but they'll be filing it themselves. And that has evolved where now there is a digital facilitated, facilitated self-assistance and I'll go into that um, in some later slides, but essentially it's just a digital space now. One or two volunteers are av available by a digital chat or phone call and they are on standby when a client has questions while they're doing the, the tax returns themselves. And then the third one is virtual FIDA. Um, so with COVID-19, there's a lot of sites across the country that shifted from the traditional um, model to doing taxes virtually because of the safety and security that it offers to the clients and to the volunteers. And it's 100% um, virtual for the client. I'm going to go to the next slide here. So United Way of King County and the free tax campaign. Um, United Way of King County itself is 100 years old. And the free tax campaign is about 20 years old. We were founded in year 2000 is when we stepped in to, to do this. Uh, but uh, the slide that I have up right now, I have a story of one of our clients and how it's hard to find places to do their taxes and be comfortable with doing it. Um, but some of these stats came from 2017 before our shutdown. Um, as an or as as uh, as a program, we've done 22,700 tax returns in 2017, 30 million dollars in refunds, 40 plus languages spoken by our volunteers. The list goes on. Um, we usually activate about 900 volunteers each year, and we usually. Uh, uh, do 20,000 plus tax returns each year. But taking this back to the beginning, um, when United Way of King County was just founded 100 years ago, um, the main focus of the organization was tackling our community's toughest challenges. And going to year 2000, when the free tax campaign was founded, the reason why the, the campaign was founded was because our leaders at United Way King County believe that people were stuck in poverty because of the safety nets that exist. People were missing out of the earned income tax credit. People were missing out of other credits that they deserved. Um, people were paying top dollars to paid preparers. Um, so that's the reason why our leaders decided to step in and we rallied up. Uh, we started as a very small operation at first. Uh, we recruited just a few volunteers um, the story goes that we partnered with an organization called the, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and we were located in a small town called White Center in a town between West Seattle and Burien in Washington State. And we chose that location because um, it was smack dab right in the middle of the population that we wanted to serve. 
we had to, from the ground up, build our knowledge of tax code, and we had to start building the infrastructure of, of the free tax campaign. Along the ways from that, from that experience, there was a lot of lessons learned. And one of the big things, or one of the biggest lessons was that uh, free, uh, the reputation behind free and trust was not in alignment. So we had to do a lot of training, a lot of uh, workshopping to build that trust, to um, let people know that free taxes meant that it was safe, it was effective, and it was accurate. And we also had to scale as an organization by working with our local government, our state, federal, and private uh, partners to really expand the infrastructure. Um, the, the main lesson then at that time was we could not work in silos. There's, there's no way we could have done that to build that trust with our government agencies, to build that trust with our clients. We could not be working independently. It was about working with our community to grow the service. Um, so the first year, we completed 1,700 returns. And you can see how we have grown so far with 2017 completing 22,700 tax returns from 1,700 uh, 20 years ago. So now we partner with organizations like KeyBank. Uh, we partner with Express Credit Union to make sure that folks who need ITIN applications or renewals are served. ITINs are for folks who doesn't have social security numbers and, and there are very important uh, participants in our tax, um, in our taxes. Essentially, uh, to conclude this slide, it's like all of us working together was what made this happen or what made the growth happen. So going into March, 2020, we all know what happened at that time. Programs were shut down. Some towns were experiencing shelter in place. Um, so I just want to bring our minds there real quick before we get into our interactive piece of, 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 of March 2020. And um, Jenny, I, I, do you want me to hand, hand it to you for the interactive piece? Sure, yeah. Uh, once again, we're calling for your comments. You've heard now a little bit about the United Way model. Um, how do you think the pandemic has changed tax time? How has it changed taxes for families? Um, and how do you think it's changed the free tax um, campaign, the free tax preparation campaign? Um, I should say I'm not only a tax, I'm not only a tax researcher um, and a, a social policy researcher. I'm also a longtime volunteer at the United Way program. And it's just been a joy over the years uh, to see this program grow and change. Uh, I volunteered in their very first year at White Center. Um, I was sitting in the in a, a storefront and I think I prepared three clients' taxes the entire year. Um, the most recent years I've been um, volunteering in the um, tax preparation campaign at Seattle Central Library. And often I'll do three or four clients in a single day and we'll get dozens of folks through there. So, um, all right, so I have a couple of notes here, but if, um, Somebody said, you know, I worry that next pe fewer people will get connected to the tax campaign. Um, there are questions about whether the United Way will still be able to find volunteers. Um, somebody says, I'm having a lot of trouble finding a site. Uh, we're looking into becoming a partner, though. Um, yeah, somebody's wondering if United Way Virtual will be serving all of Western Washington. So it's great to see that there are some service providers there. Uh, uh, yes, there's another good client. Um, taxpayers will be confused around how taxes work with unemployment and stimulus funds. Uh, and that is absolutely a consideration um, we need to think about. VITA volunteers will have to work hard to, to figure that out and to help their tax, um, their tax filers think about it. Um, concerns about in-person and capacity um, even whether in person um, we'll be able to operate. Um, and because tax season is a time um, where a lot of people are stressed or a lot of people have high feelings around it, um, 
it, it is nice to have the face-to-face -face interaction that tax sites provide. Um, and so thinking about ways to do that um, and, and to help ensure people that the system is safe, their information is safe, and that they're getting good tax preparation and helpful connections to other services um, is good. So, um, all right, we have some questions here about partnering with sites. Um, and indeed the answer to that is to, to work out, to reach out to Terrence. Um, Terrence, do you maybe wanna talk a little bit about how you all did pivot um, and some of the opportunities for serving clients outside of your traditional areas? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that will go into the next slide actually. Um, thank you for that. And these are some wonderful questions um, that we, yeah, that came up during the, the shutdown and we are thinking through a lot of them. So tax prep during the pandemic, there is no way I can talk about <laughs> it without shining some light um, and just doing a huge shout out to Code for America. Um, they're out of, uh, they're out, uh, out of, they're based out of California, but they created this platform called Get Your Refund um, that does virtual taxes. And um, they've started as a small program at first with the intent was not behind COVID-19. The intent was to service rural areas um, that did not have access to free tax sites. And during the shutdown, their mission, their purpose just aligned very well with the timing it was just impeccable the timing that they became um they showed when they showed up on the scene and i recall the day that me and a couple of my colleagues were just doing some research on how we wanted to pivot at our with our tax sites and we found a post it was on twitter from the code for america um, social media um outreach and we followed up on that and ever since then, uh, we've been one of their partners since March in uh, one of their larger sites. And we're plugged in with their engineers for the next season. And it's been a really, really awesome, awesome ride. Um, but with that said, the uh, United Way of King County was in a position with the resources of the volunteers that we had and the capacity that we had to transform very quickly. Uh, when working with the, the Code for America team, um, we were able to pivot within two weeks. And a lot of that had to do with some of our volunteers that we had, some worked at Amazon, some worked at Microsoft. They know they knew how to speak the language and they knew how to get us up. So the 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 the, the knowledge was there to uh, kind of help with um, making sure that all the ducks were in a row to make sure that we are able to um, to to uh, transition. Or, um, and with COVID, with the digital transformation, it became a little bit more than just preparing taxes. As you recall, um, we had our stimulus checks, the economic impact payments that um, folks were entitled to. We've noticed a lot of people uh, did not get them automatically because uh, the 2018 or 2019 tax return was not completed. Uh, so my volunteers also shifted in a way to uh, learn um, what's the new way to process the economic impact payment because we can do it ourselves as certified volunteers or we could also help coach um, our clients to do it themselves if they have to use the non-filers tool or if they have to connect with us because they need to get their 2018 or 2019 tax return completed. We also offered a uh, hotline for people who are doing taxes um, as a do-it-yourself option. Something that we found was uh, we had to build trust behind um, Code for America and get your refund because from our website, it takes them to a different, entirely different website. And for a client who is being told to be careful with sharing their sensitive information during this time. Um, it's expected for them to to scrutinize a website and ensure that it is safe and it's okay for them to upload their social security number 
or their W-2s or their IDs of their self and their kids, of their family members. And it was, it totally made sense. Um, so hosting a hotline to help clients to uh, navigate through those questions was something that was uh, very important during during the digital transformation. Um, one one way I want to preface this is uh, when my volunteers transferred over. Um, her name is Lily. She she referenced this time frame as the wild the wild west <laughs> of of getting taxes done. But there was a lot of magic um, that was uh, happening at that time. You know, as I as I said earlier, a Code for America's original goal was not to be a COVID-19 response. It was just that their timing was impeccable and it aligned with the purpose and mission and all of that. And their first initial goal was to only partner with like five client, uh, five partners, do 5,000 returns. Um, we just ended our COVID response. So October 15 was the time that uh, Code for America um, needed to uh, shut down their operation so they can go and plan for the, for, for the next season. And the last update that I received was from a 5,000 tax return and original goal. You know, they're at like 20,000 returns done. And now they're partnering with like 60 plus partners across the country. So it is just growing um, um, with the partners and, and, and for going into the next season, it's all about taking that to the next level. And what I saw from the field in terms of working with other VITA programs and having some other conversations was that um, working with Code for America, they provide the coders, the programmers, the engineers, and the product managers. And this takes us back to like that conversation about we cannot be working in silos. A lot of organizations do not have the capability to create their own digital service. And an organization like Code for America offering these coders and programmers and engineers was just something that was magical with, with the timing. So going into next season, this slide that I have up is just a really quick and dirty of, of how it works uh, for our volunteers and our clients uh, moving forward. Um, what I do want to preface this with is I cannot stress enough that safety is our number one priority going to the next season. Um, there's uh, our COVID-19 uh, response. It's like front and center on our website and all our marketing, making ensuring that our volunteers and our clients who see any of our outreach materials know that that, that safety is top of mind and it's not something that is not on the planning table. It's there on the planning table when we when we do any sort of planning. Uh, but we will be offering tax help, and it will be primarily virtual for our clients. All positions um, that are for preparing taxes will be virtual as well, so volunteers can do taxes from the safety and comfort of their homes. And going to next season, we had set the goal to do twenty thousand tax returns and bring back. 400 plus volunteers. And the reason why we're thinking through uh, doing that many tax returns and bringing on that many volunteers is because we as an organization know that uh, help, uh, re the request for help and processing of the economic impact payment is going to increase. Refunds and credits for people who need help is going to increase. We understand that the time that we are living in now, like, this, like we know, like unemployment has dipped a little bit in, in our area, but we know that it's still at record high level. Food bank usage is at record high level. So as an organization, we want to ensure that our volunteers who are aligned with, with that mindset are available for our clients who will need our services. And we are just, we're, we're, we are just committed to ensuring that we are able to meet that demand uh, for, for those. So from a volunteer aspect, our virtual roles will have um, our, our virtual roles will be for our preparers. And I want to showcase a volunteer that I have named Marty. 
um, Marty was brought to us from an organization called Solid Grounds, and they plug in senior citizens into volunteer roles. And Marty, when I worked with him, he had no background in technology, uh, but he just had a curiosity for technology. And with just that curiosity, Marty has turned out to be one of my best volunteers. Um, but one thing that would not work is if I have a volunteer who just had zero interest in technology to become a remote volunteer, that just won't work. The minimum requirement is at least curiosity to using technology. We use programs called Slack for our communication. So instead of 33 in-person sites we will that we usually have, we will be breaking those into uh, 33 different channels on our Slack. So Slack is the program and we're able to break up channels in Slack so we can still create a team environment for our volunteers. Each team will still have one or two managers. So our in-person site used to have a site manager that offered guidance and mentorship and, and tax law, um, uh, tax, they can answer tax law questions. They will still have that opportunity on their individual channels. And then we're also thinking through a community community intake volunteer role. Um, in the spirit of breaking things down, it's important that we have, uh, uh, we are able to somehow utilize our food banks that we already have drive through um, services happening. And this was something that came out of a client um, survey that we produced. People are asking for ways to help them with intake for digital because people don't have computers, people don't have uh, smartphones, and it just makes sense with with digital transformation, barriers do increase. And a community intake volunteer role was something that we uh, we created to respond to that. And it was it's essentially a volunteer with a tablet at one of our food banks that already have a in-person uh, process established and plugging them in there to help scan documents. And the last piece is the client journey for our clients who end up on the di digital. It's the exact same journey that they would experience in the in-person. In our in-person, you would have to talk to a volunteer to make sure that everything that you provided, like your W-2s, are um, a, a complete picture. Each client on the digital will be receiving a phone call they will be, uh, the volunteer will be reviewing their digital IRS intake sheet. And they will still have the same questions that are like, hey, client, you said that you had three jobs in your digital intake sheet, but you uploaded two W-2s. So they'll be able to deconflict those issues where they've identified if there's a missing document or not. Each client will still be able to participate in a quality review process, just like in our intake in in-person site. Um, instead, they'll be getting a call from a different volunteer with the same certification level that will review their tax situation their, 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 and their tax documents just like the tax preparer and still have that high quality, quality review process conducted. And they will participate in an electronic signature process where we use DocuSign so, so they can submit their taxes. And um, once they complete the DocuSign, we'll be able to uh, email or text them, um, hey, your tax return was accepted um, type, type of message. So, they're, so essentially their, their, um, their journey will be the same as the in-person journey. So all in all, you know, the biggest takeaway here was that barriers do increase with the digital transformation but we cannot be working in silos. It will be about working with our grantee agencies to ensure we are in alignment with our access requirements and working with banks like Express Credit Union to see if we are in alignment with what their practice looks like going to next season um, so we can continue to serve IT customers or working with like our food banks to utilize that space for quick and safe uh, uploads of tax documents into our secure system. Um, so in a nutshell, that is what we are doing going to next season. And uh, I'll go ahead and give it back to Jenny now. Great. Thanks, Terrence. Um, it, it's great that United Way is adjusting and um, building the new capacity. I will also say, um, Terrence, I, you and I didn't talk about this beforehand. I didn't know you were going to reference Marty, but I've actually worked with Marty at the Central Library, volunteered on the same shift with him for the last few years. And not only does he 
know a lot about taxes and have a great curiosity for technology and many other things. He also makes peanut brittle, um, which is one of those things that I fear won't translate well to the um, remote environment, but probably better for my teeth. Um, so a lot of the questions and comments um, in the, um, that you all suggested are things that will make it, um, Terrence, next slide, please, um, that will make it tricky for next tax season. So not only are the logistics going to be a challenge for how to engage clients, how to work with them um, and give them a good experience, but tax time itself is going to be a lot of different, a, a lot of diff going to have a lot of differences from last year. Um, a couple of those are not everyone filed last year. Uh, the IRS was expecting 155 million filers, um, but then um, the national shutdowns hit in the middle of the tax filing season. Uh, there was then a 23% increase in people who prepared by themselves and a corresponding decrease in um, people who use the commercial tax preparer. Um, the number of visits to irs.gov went up by 164%, uh, but they still had fewer filers than they were expecting, uh, even though there were some people who they know filed only to get the economic impact payment. Um, so that's um, that was one concern. So we may have more people coming in who didn't file for one reason or another last year um, and who need to file for two years. Uh, unemployment insurance and how it's taxed and how it's treated for withholding is going to cause a lot of changes in, in a lot of different possible ways. Um, there may be families who hadn't been eligible for the earned income tax credit before or who were on that kind of phase out portion where the benefit went down, um, who may get larger tax returns because they only worked for part of the year. Your earned income is what qualifies you for the EITC, not your um, unemployment insurance. However, um, most people have at least some um, income withheld from their earnings, and most people don't have money automatically withheld from their um, unemployment compensation. Anecdotally, I saw this as a tax volunteer. When you get a, a 1099 uh, from the Washington State Unemployment or Employment Security Department, most often it reports the income and shows no withholding. Um, and I actually talked with someone in employment security trying to figure out um, what percentage of people do withhold and whether or not how just how that process works. Um, they're slammed right now and don't have time to do the analysis to figure out a percentage, but she confirmed what I thought, which is most people don't withhold. Their default is no withholding. Uh, if someone asks, they tell them to consult their tax professional. Um, you know, they do give some general information that says, well, if you withhold, you're less likely to owe taxes to the IRS. Um, but, but it's not the same system that you would have with an employment situation where there's somebody in the payroll department trying to make sure that your um, tax withholding will be adequate to, to fit your tax bill. So we may have some tax filers, particularly um, people who had higher in income because of the unemployment um, or who don't have dependents who end up um, owing taxes because of their unemployment insurance. Um, and just in general, there was a lot of disruption um, to employment and to earnings. So somebody who's used to working, you know, most of the year and who got laid off, um, just there, there's just a lot of uncertainty. And so I think there's going to be more anxiety, more uncertainty, less ability to kind of predict things going forward. Um, so a lot of a lot of unknown unknowns. Um, all right, Terrence, could you go to the next slide now? Um, we have a few minutes left here and we're happy to look for questions or comments. Um, we've already had some questions going in. Uh, Terrence, perhaps you could address how partners could be volunteers in Mason County or other areas in Washington. There's some questions um, about that. And if folks have other questions, about tax season, about thinking about making connections for your clients or constituents, just put them in the chat and we're happy to happy to have a conversation with you. 
I'm going to go ahead and just address that question real quick um, regarding um, volunteers from a different county. And I'm going to put my email on uh, the chat in a little bit after this. But it's what I see with those um, type of conversations. It's it's really nice to have an organization that already has an established like uh, uh, plan for how they're going to do volunteers, especially if we have shifts and we have um, site managers per shift. So these volunteers, if they show up, let's just say they, they sign up for a Tuesday at a 10 o'clock shift, there's going to be someone there who can guide them and mentor them through the tax law. Um, and it's not just the tax law. These, these site managers are also going to be helping them with um, the operation. So getting on Slack, getting on DocuSign, getting on a team's um, presentation so they can work together and, and still work as a team. And I, I think that's how some partnership will evolve because we have some partnership with the University of Washington with, with their accounting team, the CLU. And um, I'm, I'm essentially just creating uh, a group for their, uh, for their students and giving them a special link for them to sign up. And essentially from the back end on my team, I will give that, that, you know, that contact list to that site manager who will be taking over that team to provide that guidance and mentorship. Um, I'm going ahead and uh, put my email in there. Let me know if that answers that question. Okay, someone else had a question about what is the hotline number. Um, Terrence, can folks call 211? Is that the best way to get connected or? Yeah, um, we don't, so the hotline number, we, we so when I was talking about the hotline, the hotline was something that we uh, created back in March. And sometimes in June or so, we stopped doing the hotline and because United Way worldwide started offering a hotline for the economic impact payment. And we just started uh, recommending folks to uh, contact uh, United Way worldwide. And we offered them our volunteers who had the background and knowledge behind that so they can offer additional capacity. Um, and so, so that's, that's the story behind the hotline. So we don't have one at this moment. Okay, another question about how to become a volunteer. Are you accepting volunteers outside of the Seattle area? Yes, um, yeah. that's a great question. That's the type of question that I enjoy. Uh, we have some volunteers <laughs> that moved and they're in California right now with family or they're hunkered down in like Texas with family. And I'm like, they're a former volunteer. They know the United Way, they know um, they're possibly going to be in a team with the site manager that they actually worked with in person back in the day. So I'm like, yes, this is totally good. Uh, the virtual role, it's you, you do it from the comfort of your home. Um, so I'll put the website link on the chat as well, but it's essentially going to uh, uh, uwkc.org uh, forward slash tax volunteer. And we just kicked off volunteer recruitment about a week ago um, on Thursday. I was able to oversee uh, the website. The, I was able to uh, have the power of hitting the on button for the website being um, updated and all the social media being launched and all that. So I'll put the link on here. Um, there's still a bunch of positions. If you volunteered with us before, uh, you're able to uh, sign up for a partial um, season, which is new going into this season. It's just a um, an eight-week stint that is uh, during the peak time of tax season versus the full season because we know – um, with digital, it does get exhausting, and there is a fatigue that happens when you're uh, uh, working for the full season. So it's another opportunity that allows us to uh, work with volunteers who want to um, have a shorter window than the full window uh, for uh, a volunteer uh, opportunity. Great question. Thank you. Okay, and we had another question from Lorena. What's the geographic area being served by the Get Your Refund Code from America? Right now, it is the entire uh, United States of America, um, the entire country is on Code for America, and they just funnel you to the closest Vita site um, that you are, um, that's in, in, in your area. So right now, in Washington State, United Way of King County, I believe the last time I got an update was the only uh, uh, Vita, virtual Vita site that's working with Code for America. So everybody who popped up in Lacey or Tacoma, they did get funneled to us. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I don't know who the new partners are um, into the next season, but we as an organization, we just don't, we 
we don't put that we're servicing the entire um, Washington state on our like client facing materials, but essentially with the back end and how code for America works, they are getting funneled. All of them are getting funneled to us. And then if there's a new uh, Vida site that partners that's in Washington state, then it will probably be, uh, they'll, probably de they'll, they'll, they'll probably create a barrier based off the zip codes and how that, um, or how that gets uh, funneled. Great. Okay. I, I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, Terrence did put the link to volunteer in there. Um, and this is one of the values of this, this live um, session, which is, you know, you can get information such as we can, you know, there is no, there is no geographic limit. There's, um, this is something that is open to folks um, statewide. So um, anyhow, we, on behalf of both me and Terrence, we'd really like to um, thank people for coming. Um, I'm thrilled to see that we might have gotten a new volunteer or two uh, for Terrence. Uh, he and I were talking last week when he did get to to push the the go button for the volunteer thing. And as a returning volunteer, I got a Facebook notice um, that day. So um, I hadn't clicked yet. Uh, and so I'll, I, I may actually think about signing up for the eight week schedule that has um, that has a lot of appeal to it. Um, it's it's most fun to do it on the busiest weeks. So anyhow, thank you all for attending our um, session today on tax time. Terrence, maybe you could go to the, the last slide, um, which just says thanks. Um, thanks for coming. Um, thanks for working with us. I urge you, um, if you are in Washington State, um, think about volunteering if you have clients or constituents um, or ways that folks in your community could connect with the Code for America, uh, get your refund United Way effort. Um, please think about that. Um, if you work at a financial institution, um, think about ways that you could perhaps serve your customers in helping to prepare them for tax season and partnering with a local VITA site or with a statewide effort. Um, and finally, remember that tax time is a really important time for families. Um, in Washington state, we could also advocate for funding for our working families tax credit. Um, although Washington does not have an income tax, we have a state version of the EITC that has been passed but not funded. Um, and that is something that we could do to start um, chipping away at our upside down tax code. So um, it really takes a lot of people to um, serve and serve our fellow citizens through tax season. Um, but this is a great opportunity. Uh, you know, 2020 has had its pitfalls um, and there are a lot of puzzles that uh, folks like Terrence and I know folks on the ground here are, are working out every day. Um, but I think there's also a lot of promise here for asset building and for creating financial stability. So thank you all for coming um, and we'll hand it back. Uh, we're a few minutes early, but I think we'll hand it back to Alice who has a closing video here. Thank you. Thanks, Terrence. Bye. Hello, everyone. We are close to the end of day two of our 2020 Bank on Washington Forum. Thank you for joining us. My name is Alice Cody, Executive Director with the Financial Empowerment Network and the convening organization for Bank on Washington. As you heard from presenters over two days, collectively, we have the power to address economic inequality and help our neighbors in need. Together, we can address the ways economic systems limit people's individual choices and help them on a forward-moving financial trajectory. If you represent a bank or credit union or a local ABC or Bank on Coalition, I hope you will join us on day three for the discussion group that follows the Bank on Washington Forum. The FDIC and Bank on Washington invite you to join a discussion on the Community Development Service expanding participation in bank or coalitions. The target audience for this meeting includes asset building coalitions, bank on coalitions, financial institutions, including banks and credit unions, and municipal government. 
During the discussion, you will learn about the Seattle Clemency Project. I would like once again to thank our Bank of Washington planning team and our sponsors. Thank you to Becky, Tracy, Irwin, Will, Sylvia, Lynn, Jared, Ryan, Carmen, Adam, and Linda. Thank you so much for your ongoing support and the great work in putting together this forum. Couldn't have done it without you. I would also like to thank the DFI and the Cities for Financial Empowerment Fund for their support in relaunching Bank on Washington in 2019. Thank you to Columbia Bank as our lead sponsor and to our other supporting sponsors, Bank of America, Banner Bank, Humpqua Bank, Express Credit Union, Washington 529, and Northwest Access Fund. I also want to thank American Financial Solutions and Becky House for her support as our Bank on Washington co-chair. And also, thank you to all of our local coalitions and the great work that they're doing during COVID-19 and helping move people along the financial trajectory. I'd like to again thank Columbia Bank and leave you with a message from Kara Thompson, the Chief Compliance Officer at Columbia Bank. Thank you, Kara, for joining us. Columbia Bank was established in 1993 as a community bank. We are headquartered in Tacoma, Washington, and offer comprehensive solutions and expertise to meet the evolving needs of businesses, nonprofits, and individuals throughout our Pacific Northwest footprint. As our community and the bank have grown, we remain true to our original commitment to put people first. Columbia Bank's people are at the center of our community engagement programs. We empower our employees to address the unique needs of their communities through four distinct pillars. One, fundraising. Two, employee giving. Three, volunteerism. And four, company giving. Providing support through employee-driven pillars allows us to have the greatest impact. Because of these efforts, we are deeply woven into the fabric of our communities. Additionally, this grassroots approach allows us to focus on what makes each community unique. Employees are encouraged to use 40 hours of paid volunteer time each year to actively engage with the organizations of their choosing. Our people collaborate to support both bank-wide funding campaigns and our local campaigns championed by their peers and our clients. Employees vote with their dollars on what they care most about through their own charitable contributions. And Columbia Bank matches those gifts up to $100 per employee annually. One example of a Columbia Bank fundraising campaign is the annual Warm Hearts Winter Drive Initiative, which serves people experiencing homelessness. 2019 marked the fourth year of this program, during which we raised just over $313,000 and collected over 6,000 items of warm winter wear for adults and children. 100% of the funding and wear are distributed to local shelters. Since inception, Columbia has raised over $1,154,000 and has collected more than 20,000 items for over 60 shelters across our region. This was made possible through generous donations from clients, employees, and the bank. We look forward to the launch of the 2020 campaign in the coming weeks. Thank you, Kara. And thank you everyone for joining the 2020 Bank on Washington Forum. Enjoy the rest of your day.